Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is self-professed language geek Mark England. As a martial artist, Mark was driven by his need to succeed. It took a severe injury and knee surgery to help him uncover what was driving him to the breaking point. In the recovery process, he found language as a tool to transform his life and has gone on as a language geek to be a TEDx speaker and help thousands of people better their lives with how they think and speak. If you enjoy today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and live their dreams. And now, here is Paul and Mark with Tongue and Truth. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, our topic is tongue and truth. I'll let you just meditate on that one for a minute. And our guest today, we actually have two guests, Mark England and his community manager or the Enlifted community manager, Kim Kesting. Is it Kesting, Kim? Correct. Cool. I got it right. Mm -hmm. I sometimes screw names up, so I didn't want (laughs) to just keep saying it wrong. Um, Mark came recommended to me by several sources, one of which was my buddy, Mike Salemi, who's always accurate. He never tells me I should interview someone that isn't really good. And so that began my sort of investigation into Mark and listening to a podcast and and just checking him out. And I thought what Mark had to share was really quite powerful. And Mark, you and I had, what, a couple of one or two meetings? I can't remember, but we've been going back and forth and talking about it all. So welcome to Living 4D, Mark and Kim. Thank Thank you you for having us, Paul. Yeah, my pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. So we're going to talk about a lot of very interesting things and and important things today. Uh, And I have had Laurel Erica on my show, who's an English English linguist expert, but I really found your approach quite enough different from hers that I thought it was worth uh, sharing more because uh, the topics we're going to talk about are just so, not only are they very important in general, but today they're very important. Mm. When people get under stress, you know, what happens is they start getting all their shadow language going Mm. and they start putting themselves into... um, projections of things that are usually much worse than reality actually is. And so that's the inner language. And I think when it comes to our, most people's unconscious relationship with their powers of manifestation, they don't realize they're putting a lot of energy into what they don't want instead of not only what they want, but what's best for everybody in their family and and society and culture and the world. So I'm sure we'll have time to get into a lot of that today. But uh, I wanted to start by, with this, Mark, it's well known that uh, language in general influences at a very deep level. I'd love it if you can share some of the science and philosophy regarding the mechanisms of how language influences us. And I'm sorry I'm I'm addressing you, but I mean either of you can share whatever, whatever. I'll let you two fight over who gets to talk. (laughs) for a brief moment, Paul, yeah. I thought once we got the uh, got the the show notes mm-hmm. about going in and brushing up uh, on the neuroscience yeah. behind this thing, and I got out of that very quickly because uh, I am a very simple person when it comes to this conversation. Uh, good. And uh, as far as the 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 neuroscience hardware software, all that is. Negation acknowledged, Mm -hmm. not my area of specialty. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd get half of it right, which means I'd get it wrong. That's okay. (laughs) What what I speak about definitively, as far as the mechanism, and we really like that word in the enlifted conversation, Mm -hmm. we speak definitively about how our everyday ordinary language influences four main aspects of our experience of ourself that everyone can relate to. Yeah. So- When I say language or we talk about language, we're talking about our internal dialogue Mm -hmm. and our external dialogue. Yes. What we think, what we say, our speech, and what we write. Uh, Or do. Correct. And how our language influences these four key areas. Mm -hmm. Our imagination, our feelings and emotions, our physiology, our posture, and and how we breathe. Mm -hmm. And what we've found is that 
breaking this conversation down. We ha- we've done a, a few, I'll, I'll give ourselves a pat on the back here at Inlifted. We've done a, a, a few things very well. Mm-hmm. One, demystifying the conversation about words and stories and how they influence our identities for better and for worse. Mm-hmm. And also we've gamified it, made it simple and, and fun for people to understand, implement in their everyday ordinary life. Uh, we certify coaches, make it easy for them to share with their clients, turn around and teach. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what we found is when we keep it simple in those regards, other people, other other experts in, in neuroscience, they're going to do a much better job mm-hmm. of laying out the entirety of that conversation than we would, or I, I, I can say for sure that I would. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, so we keep it simple in, mm-hmm. in, the, in those regards. And, yeah. and absolutely our language does influence those and it does it simultaneously. Mm-hmm. So when I say something and very rarely we, we, we did a training, uh, a workshop for all the Invictus coaches right. yesterday. Uh, it's a, that's a popular CrossFit, very popular, successful CrossFit gym in, in San Diego. Um, we, we talked about how very rarely, and it's one of the things we're going to do today, is slow down the conversation about how our language influences us for better and for worse so we can make distinctions about what words are forcing us to stare at the worst case scenario make the victim villain mental imagery, mm-hmm. hello victim mentality, yeah. create excess anxiety, stress, and, and, and trap our breath. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when it's slowed down, so we're not, we're not taking, we're not spending, we're investing the time to, to, to get specific about the words, then this conversation takes on, because this is a conversation about mindset in one sense. Yeah, of course. It takes on a practical um, uh, uh role and understanding for people as in they can practice thinking, speaking, and writing in different ways. And all it takes is a little bit uh, of, of adjusting, manicuring mm-hmm. our language. We get an immediate return right now and then many downstream uh, benefits. So when you say slowing down, you mean slowing down the pace that you express yourself? That's a very big part of it. Most people find benefit in slowing down their rate of speech. Mm-hmm. especially if they want to give themselves more space mm-hmm. uh, with their, their mental, mental real estate and also uh, space to connect to how the words influence their, their feelings and emotions. Mm-hmm. Most people talk so fast, mm-hmm. especially when they get into um, uh, stories of a traumatic nature mm-hmm. that hold negative emotional charge. Yeah. They 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 go very quickly in the storytelling process, which further upregulates their nervous system. Mm-hmm. It actually uh, uh, aggregates their position, how they're perceiving the 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 scenario, and makes it hard to unravel or unwind. Especially getting down to um, some of the key sentences. So if if it's okay, I'll, I'll share the story of how I came across this work, uh, and it, it it dovetails directly into the the clarification process that's very valuable for people that want to know more about their story. So very short story. I thought I was a tough guy Mm -hmm. and and (laughs) I really did, man. I wrestled in high school, got into Brazilian jujitsu and Thai boxing in college, fought, competed, loved it, did decent enough on the uh, regional circuit back in the late nineties, early two thousands. And I had the opportunity to move over to Thailand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. And the plan was go over there for a year, polish up my Thai boxing skills, mm-hmm. come back and go pro. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's totally not what happened. <laughs> I, can, I can almost predict the rest of the story. I have some insights into this whole thing. <laughs> we, very, and you're Paul Check. So we just an interesting side note on the ride up here. We're like, Paul's going to read us, read our oars immediately and tell us <laughs> what uh, what's to do with this. And if he, and I said, if he gives me a mantra to, to say for 108 days, whatever Paul tells me to do, I'm going to do it. <laughs> no, uh, I, I don't do You know, I, just so you know, people think that I do that, but I actually don't do that. And I stop doing that. Because when people heard that I did that, I, everywhere I went, I was crowded by people wanting me to say, tell them what their future is or what's wrong with their dog. And it got to be so, I, my whole life was getting choked out. And so I, my rule is, unless you ask me to do mm. that, I won't do it. Or if 
I get an image. I made a deal with my soul. Don't show me anything that it isn't important for me to talk to that person mm. about because I cannot heal the world. It, it, when I used to, there was a point in my life where there was such a powerful opening that came after about uh, a year of daily Tai Chi when I was being guided by Master Fong Ha, that my clairvoyance was so strong that everywhere I went, I could see everything in a person's life and their energy field. And it was just so emotionally uh, painful lot. because I just saw how badly wounded most people mm. are. And so it was overwhelming. So I said to myself, I can't help all these people. It's impossible. So please turn this down or off unless I want to use it and only show me what you want me to see because it's important for me to interact with that person. So you can relax. I'm not reading your energy fields. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a fun story. Though. Paul, Paul, check. Um, so I move over to Thailand and you can see where this story is going. <laughs> yeah. Generally speak. It's going to pain. <laughs> it and suffering and the victim mentality, which I will recite for the umpteenth hundredth time. Uh, very happily, by the way. So uh, six months later, I have my second knee surgery. Uh -huh. And the doctor tells me, You're, it's over. Mm. Okay, Darkness descends. Mm. I use that experience in, in, in my lack of wisdom as a definitive stamp on me that in the greatest, uh, up until that time, um, this was a big deal for me to move over there. Mm. Okay, I'd only had my passport for a couple of years. I'm, mm. a, I'm a Virginia guy, born and raised, so are my parents. So moving over there, it's a thing. Uh -huh. And um, and I used that experience as evidence. I compiled evidence, proof that I was not good enough. I was doomed to fail and there was something wrong with me. Mm. I didn't laugh for a year, Paul. I don't recommend that for anybody. It's a very weird space to reside in. Mm -hmm. it, it, my face, I, just, I, was, I was sour heading towards bitterness, which mm. is dangerous. Mm. Anyway, I got sick of that and recognized that, hey, man, if I'm 55 and I'm complaining about this woulda, coulda, shoulda mm -hmm. thing that didn't happen for me, then I really am a loser. Fine. I'll take anything but that. Mm -hmm. I'll take anything but that. And so I was living in Bangkok um, uh, at the time and and elementary school sports teacher, I had, I had a lot of time and, and, and resources. So I went down to the spa, which was a fasting and detox resort mm. on the island of Koh Samui. And uh, pay to not eat for seven days. Great gig for them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, let, me, let me put a workshop on for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Come on in, cough it up. You get nothing. Um, and you're going to come back. So, And I did. My third time down there. Uh, I met a man by the name of Barry Musgrave who turned into my mentor with this work. He was doing, this was in 2003, late three, doing a workshop on emotional detoxification, which me and all my smarts snickered at the name <laughs> emotional detox. I went though. Mm, well, that, that's smart. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm grateful I did. And guess what he talked about? Words, stories, identities. And then he asked, is there anyone that's, uh, that's hanging on to a story. You can't get it out of your head. And this woman shot up her arm. And it was a legit stinger of a breakup story. She told the story of, uh, this is in, in, it was beach week. For all, all her friends got a house down at the beach. All her boyfriend's friends got a house right next door. Add alcohol, drama ensues. Mm -hmm. He hooked up with one of her friends in front of everybody the night before and then dumped her in front of everybody the next night. Mm -hmm. Ouch on three. Mm. Right. <laughs> but probably better now than later. <laughs> yes. And because he helped her get to the one sentence. So back to slowing down the storytelling process mm. so we can see where the linchpins mm -hmm. are. And a lot of times it's one sentence. It's the Lord of the Rings. It binds the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. And in this case, he had her tell the story three times and he got the whole thing done in under 10 minutes. So she told the story. He let her uh, uh, tell it verbatim. So this was her first draft. She was angry and crying. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell that story a second time. He goes through it and starts to adjust some of the language. And you can see her body posture start mm -hmm. to change in her face. And she was looking more quizzical. Now she was sad, no tears. Third time through, he stopped her because he knew about the words. He stopped her at the one sentence that forced her to take it personally, mm -hmm. as in make the whole thing about her, mm -hmm. maintain that stress response, that amygdala hijack, mm -hmm. breath trapped in the chest. There, this, this is 
It's, it's, it's per, like I said, it's personal. And the sentence was, he did that to me. Right. And he had her say that out loud again and made sure everybody paid close attention. Mm -hmm. This is when my world went from flat to round with the story I was telling myself about what happened, quote unquote, to me mm -hmm. and the fact that I could change it. And, and he had, she, he did that to me at the end. He said, take out me and put in himself. Mm -hmm. And so the story now goes, he did that to himself. And you see her talk herself, walk herself, socialize a new story almost immediately about mm. the whole thing, which changed the perspective. And she goes, he, he did that to himself. It went up at the end. It was a question because it was so new of a story. It was a radical departure from that entrenched victim mentality, uh, of, uh, victim villain uh, mental imagery that that sentence would create for everyone. This conversation, folks, has zilt to do with intelligence. Mm -hmm. That sentence, if I believed it or if Einstein believed it, it's going to create a victim and a mm -hmm. villain. Mm -hmm. He's in the picture. He's doing something to me. I'm on the receiving end mm -hmm. and just it, it, prop, it perpetuates. And so she goes, he did. He, he did do that to himself. And then she tells the part of the story about what happened to him. So he lost, his social credit score took a digger. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, he lost friends. Um, it, was, it, was, it was actually worse for him. And then she because she got out of that uh, stuck place with the story, she goes, you know, that guy was actually pretty weird. It was never going to work out anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just took a little while for her to process it. 100%. And, and it happened pretty quickly because not only did he help her with the words, he helped her slow down her rate of storytelling. Mm -hmm. So we're known as the language people. We might as well be known as the language and the breathing people, which we'll get into here in a moment. And the whole thing's storytelling, Paul. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the whole story, thing. it's yeah. myth it's the it's it's the i mean and and on in some of these show notes you asked you know how powerful is the story that we tell ourselves mm -hmm. it it might be the most powerful force in 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 most powerful and consistent isn't even the right word it's relentless mm -hmm. so when people are going to sleep most people the last thing that they recognize before they go off into the dream state is their voice in their own head yeah and it's the first thing that we hear when we're waking up. It's not like I get up and go make some coffee and stretch and then I start thinking. No, mm -hmm. as soon as I'm coming out of it, the story starts. Mm -hmm. And most people's language works against them. Mm -hmm. And we're committed to helping people get their language to work for them. Simple math. Part of that is that nobody's story is their own. It's true too. My point being... That story you just told involved another man and a bunch of people watching. You know, one of the exercises I give my students to make something very clear to them is that an ego is really a collection of ideas that are like software that we're running, right? So here's how I show this to people. If I had a quantum computer and I could download every idea and belief that you have in your mind that you think is your own and put it on a spreadsheet and let you go through and identify which of these ideas are authentic authentically of your own creation what percentage of those ideas of the potentially billions of them in your nervous system or mind would be authentically your own and most people come to the realization probably about two percent i think that's that's take out the think that's generous yeah, it is generous. Yeah, as a pro, you are a prolific writer. Okay, now especially <laughs> having seen the the backstory, and uh, if you ever get a chance to look this, go to Paul Checkhouse. It's just amazing. <laughs> and and Jordan Peterson said, "There's no difference between thinking and writing." Well, you're writing what you're thinking. <laughs> exactly. And most people don't even have a draft to hand in. They don't get their words on paper, so yeah. they can then. Um, go through an editing drafting process mm -hmm. or a, a distillation process and literally an alchemical process yeah. to they get, so they get to somewhere where they, their words are of value of thinking and repeating and believing in. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you're right about the uh, lack of um, auth authentic, not authenticity, but um, novelty. Correct. And, uh, um, uh, it's not ingenuity. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, most most people our inherit our language is inherited. We've inherited our language. We mm -hmm. inherit this storytelling mechanism mm -hmm. from our parents and then the people before them. Mm 
So the way that they use their words, the way they inflect on their words, you know, we have language in our language to describe this. You, you sound just like your mother. Why do people say that? Because mm, they do. Because there's <laughs> something to it. Because they're using the same words. They're using the same words in the same way, yeah. same rate of speech. And, um, just and, don't ever tell my mother she sounds just like me because she'll get very upset. Fair enough. <laughs> she'll first thing she'll say is, "I don't swear like that." <laughs> we we love that about you, Paul. We really do because that's that's totally us too. Man, we'll we'll, right. we'll put a drop a well placed f bomb in the conversation. I've, and I've had to tame it down because Penny's constantly on top of me about that. <laughs> <laughs> Words, man. It's all about the words. Yes. And there's something... It's not all about the words. A lot of it is, though, because... Yeah. Back to the... We, we've had... In, so I have a degree in education. I got brought up in the public school system. Mm -hmm. I didn't have one course, class, or conversation about how my language influences me, for better yeah, or for I don't worse. Think, I, don't, I don't know of anyone that does. They, exactly. I, I, I asked in every workshop I put on for a number of years, and I only had three people say yes. Mm -hmm. and, and what that... What do we mean by that? Most people's education about their language comes down to spelling, grammar, and definitions. Yeah. There's a whole magical metaphysical side to the conversation. Uh, and, and, and I have three people say yes in, in a number of years, over thousands of people I've asked in workshop, and they did not go to a public school. They went to a, one went to a Montessori school, one went to a Steiner school, mm. one went to a Waldorf school. Uh, yeah. Steiner and Waldorf are the same thing. Yeah. Waldorf is Steiner. Yeah. But yeah, well, those are schools where you actually get educated. What a concept. What a concept. Yeah. Well, the, the thing that, that I wanted to bring into the conversation, which is quite deep and profound, one of the most amazing definitions of a myth is a myth is a story that tells itself. Mm. And I think everything you're saying is true, but there's something behind that that takes a fair bit of meditation to really grapple with. So when you understand that the true nature of a myth is that it's a story that tells itself, then you have to say, well, what is it that's telling the story then? And that leads to a very big mystery. You can call it God, or you can call it the universe, or you can call it the world, or whatever. Another definition of a myth is something that never happened, but is happening all the time. So I'll take that right back to your story of the lady that got dumped. What, was, what never happened was is she didn't do it to herself, or, or, or she didn't have it done to her is what I mean. But what was happening all the time was she was believing that it was done to her. So there you have a myth-generating polarity something that never happened santa claus what happens every year santa claus and a lot of these these myths um they're running they're running the show they are you know uh mm -hmm. um you know it's a in my opinion the word belief system mm -hmm. is a uh, overly fancy word for opinion and it, it, yeah, well, it, it's it. I see what you're saying, but there's a belief system is a set of ideas that are closed mm -hmm. that have a specific purpose. So, if your belief system is Christian, it has a specific purpose. If your belief system is that consciousness can only come from brains, you're a scientific materialist, and the specific purpose is to try to understand something that's very hard to understand. All myths, traditionally, are attempts to put meaning to that which cannot be understood. You know, so Zeus is the god of lightning because those people had no scientific understanding of what makes lightning, so it became a god. Mm. So we're we're always, uh, shall we say, we're in belief systems that either give us permission to stop doing the real work of finding out what's really true, which takes a lot of work, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, you got to read a lot of books to find out if Jesus was really a man and you have to be brave enough to find out you're wrong. And you got to read a lot of books to find out that there are 
many, many, many much older myths that tell exactly the same story. But the problem is, is if you do that research and you're honest with yourself, you come to a painful realization, and that is that you're buying into a story that is the recapitulation and the reformation of a previous story that's being presented to you as fact. And now that you know that, you have to either decide to stay a child and have magical consciousness and keep the story going, or you have to be brave enough to depart from the group, which means you actually have to be an adult that's capable of loving themselves and standing on their own two feet. And since most people in our in the world have not based on psychology, haven't evolved past about the age of a 12-year-old, no matter how old they are, very few people will actually confront the truth of their myth or the myth of a belief system because they say that truth and they'll get attacked and then they have to be strong enough to be on their own. Hello, everybody. If exercise is something important to you that you are sure not to miss a day of, it's important to remember that you don't get stronger in the gym, you get stronger when you rest. If you have a hard time committing yourself to exercising enough to keep yourself fit and healthy, then learning how to do it quickly and effectively is where the magic is. There's a fine line between being in the gym and overtraining and not doing enough to keep yourself fit, but there's always a sweet spot that brings you into balance, contributing to harmony in your life. If your goal is to be your fittest while being highly efficient with your time so you can engage other important aspects of your life and produce well-being, then I've written an ebook just for you, Paul Check's Big Bang Workouts. In the book, I will teach you my Big Bang approach to fitness. You will learn what makes something a Big Bang exercise so you can identify them or even create them for yourself. How to perform some of my simple but powerful Big Bang exercises. I offer three specific Big Bang workouts, simple program design techniques you can create your own Big Bang workouts with, two important rules for maximizing your workout results that apply to everyone from novice exercises to the world's best professional athletes. If you put all the information I share in Paul Check's Big Bang workouts to work in your life, you will get fitter, you'll have more energy, and you'll have more time to work in, do some art, and spend time with your loved ones. All the things that make a complete, healthy, happy human being. Get your copy of the ebook for free now at chekinstitute.com forward slash big bang. That's chekinstitute.com forward slash big bang. Enjoy Paul Check's Big Bang Workouts. You'll never feel better. If you look back at, at what you just shared about the girl who kept running the story of what was done to her. Hmm. That's the classic approach that somebody takes when they have not individuated, because that's a way to trigger empathy from other people and to get support from other people when a person is having a hard time processing and taking responsibility for the events of their life on their own. Trauma bonding. Yes, trauma bonding. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that is a, the, the victim mentality, it, it, absolutely generates a lot of energy mm -hmm. okay uh and it, and it also um creates some very strange codependencies oh, in people. Yeah. and and if that is the so um, do belief systems <laughs> so do belief systems totally. well, the victim mentality is a belief system about ourselves yeah so it's rather than a belief system about consciousness or god it's a belief system about these people are so stuck in their own story they can't get to god yet yeah and it's the uh the victim mentality is pre-existing the self-discovery journey that would lead you down that path of finding a belief system that you could align to as a truth. Mm -hmm. So if we're, if everything's happening to me and I'm the victim of circumstances outside of myself and I have no control over that and I'm disempowered, which is really what we talk about is that, that that's a construction of sentences and language and story mm -hmm. that keeps you stuck in that place. Yes it's difficult for that person to really have a true relationship with God mm -hmm. or a true relationship with a belief system because they're in a place that just completely discredits that that is an energy that exists in the world. It also takes up a lot of their mental real estate. Yes, and I would add to that and, and extend it to say that that victim mentality that correlates to the belief system is also often 
coherent in a family or in a oh, big time church or a belief any belief system so we tend to harmonize with people that have similar stories because we feel you know misery loves company so what happens is people get in groups and they keep perpetuating the language that's disempowering and then of course they're caught in the archetype of either the victim the saboteur the prostitute or the eternal child or all of them at once and so they just basically don't realize they've just turned on a meat grinder and jumped in and 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 so that's a painful place to be what what i find really interesting though is that i i don't know of anybody else beside you guys that are actually teaching people how to be aware of what's happening to them or what what they're doing to themselves because I mean, I know people that are very knowledgeable on these topics, English theorists, linguists, linguists, uh, you know, Noam Chomsky, people like that, that can really give you a lot of depth. And you can go get a university degree, but even people with the degrees don't really get trained on how to look at themselves and, and work with themselves. It's always like critical analysis of everybody else. So it's a great way to avoid your own story by just making everybody else the target. So I think what you're doing is really important because I don't know of anybody else that's actually put together a practical, simple format to take people through the steps of analyzing their story so that they can understand their language and then use that awareness to say, what is what is it that I really want in my life and what do I want to create in my life and how do I use the language, which means I have to change my thinking and then if you change your thinking in your language, then you have to change the actions that you engage, because if your actions yeah. don't match your thinking in your language, someone will lock you up as a psychopath, and you'll never be able to hold a job or a relationship. Because if you say to someone, I love you, but you act like you don't, it causes problems. If you say, I'll be there at nine, and you don't show up, and the store is not open, you'll lose your job. So it's... And that's what happens to a lot of people. They lose relationships. They lose relationship with themselves. They, they, they start not trusting themselves. And so then you get anxiety, which burn them out, and they get depressed, and then they're on drugs, and they're still telling the same story. Still telling the same story. <laughs> they just story. don't have near as many friends or as much money. And this is why we certify coaches in this technique yeah. that Mark has constructed and put together and built. And it's exactly that, to align the desired result with the actions. Yes. So to take uh, coaches that we work with primarily in health and fitness, life coaches, uh, we work with some business coaches, educators, leaders, and it's helping them first get clear on their own stories and be able to use what we call architect language. Mm -hmm. So to create and manifest what we want in our lives and put our attention on where we're going, looking forward and mm -hmm. in that vein of creation. And then being able to use this system as a plug-in to their existing coaching practice mm -hmm. to more easily create behavior change. Yes. Because we can get clear with the words and the dialogue and the stories yeah. that then influence our actions. Uh -huh. So, and a key component of that is identity. Mm -hmm. So our victim mentality puts us in the, in a place of uh, a disempowered identity. Mm -hmm. And when we can, remove the conflict language, which are the components of language that are going to perpetuate the vic victim mentality. And we can translate that into architect language and empower someone and create an identity that matches the uh, outcomes that we want and create an identity that serves that person that they can rep over and over in their head about who they are, where they're going, what they're creating, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And now I'm the person who can show up and achieve that result. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Prior to working with Mark and the Enlifted team, I was using this in health coaching and nutrition coaching. And it's, you know, the the person who is at odds with going to the gym or eating the right food, it's not for a lack of knowledge. They understand what they need to do and they understand, for lack of a better, you know, they understand the how. The reason they're failing consistently mm -hmm. is the identity component and yeah. the story they're telling themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's a significant amount of conflict language. Yeah. So we teach them the system. We integrate, we remove some of the stories and the stuck blocks and the limiting beliefs that they have around, I'm always going to be fat. Mm -hmm. Well, that's binary language. Always. I'm always going to be fat. Well, what if I could be skinny? Mm -hmm. What if I could be fit? 
what if I could be healthier? Mm -hmm. And just painting a different mental image in their minds. Mm -hmm. Because what we go back to is the language influences, our emotions, our imagination, our breathing, right? What's the, what's the first one? I'm missing it. Brain fart. Imagination. And Imagination posture. posture. Mm -hmm. So the uh, if the image in my head is constantly focused on the image of failure, the image or um, every time I've failed in the past or why I can't get to where I'm going or why I am the victim of these circumstances, the image that is not in my head is me succeeding mm -hmm. and is me at the result that I want. Mm -hmm. So if we can change the language to focus the attention to where we want to go, mm -hmm. what we want to manifest, what we want to bring into reality, that's where we're going to end up. Yeah. Paul, you hit the you, you you hit the magic word as far as especially me as a as a person, uh, simple. You know, um, I am a simple person to the core, and so am I actually. It's it's a, such a refreshing food, place to be. Food, sex, and a paintbrush. My man, <laughs> <laughs> can we can we get a, take Does that it, into a t shirt? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll give you some of the we'll we'll, we'll work out a, a royalty <laughs> deal and some smoke and some rocks <laughs> and some smoke and some rocks. And if, if <laughs> so, uh, one of my uh, no books? Well, that's, I keep it to four because Ewing said most people can't remember more than four words. So if I get the food, sex, paintbrush rocks, then. That's pretty good. I can be present with the books. <laughs> <laughs> the rest works itself out. Yeah. Uh, and, and like you said, the smoke. So one of my uh, uh, boxes to check and just coming on, the, coming up here and, and doing the podcast with you is. That's, that's everything else except for the bag. So we smoked a bag beforehand and it, it did, it put some hair on my chest. Like yeah. if, if I had walked in here with the buzz that I had, uh, in, in your office, you yeah. would have had to talk to Kimberly first because <laughs> that's, it's quite the bag. Ryan Sprague, shout out to you, buddy. It's the rumors are true about Paul's bags. Well, you know, the, the buzz is the tobacco, so it only lasts about eight or 10 minutes and then your feet are on the ground again. Yeah. And it, and when you're used to it, like I am, it's, it's quite gentle it's really like someone you know the experience is like if, if you've ever you ever had someone come offer to clean your windshield like at a street corner or something sure and all of a sudden you go wow i can see so much better so <laughs> when you got as much moving through your mind as i do and you're trying to like write books and many other things i find that it kind of just helps linearize my thinking and clean the windows and certainly i could get by without it but when i went through a midlife crisis I made a promise to myself. I am not going to work anymore unless I make it fun for mm. myself. Amen. So that bag is actually a symbol of the fact that I'm working because I choose to work, not because I'm trying to save the world or be famous or get rich, but because when I have that symbol in my hand, it's my reminder, you are choosing to do this because it's fun and it's a gift to the world as opposed to me martyring myself trying to save the world, which I found with a very painful conclusion is not possible. <laughs> the martyring part is, but the saving the world isn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, great. Great. The, 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 the bags are real. <laughs> <laughs> the are simplicity real. of the conversation. I would like to elaborate on that a yeah. little bit. So, Ladies, gentlemen, I've been doing this one thing for 15 years, somewhere between full time and overtime the whole time, <laughs> which is staring at people's words. Yes. Okay. Doing sessions, doing workshops, having people write down their stories of ouch and woe and pain, mm -hmm. and and s literally scrutinizing the words and paying attention to what words show up most often when people are describing. Um, things that have happened to them and why they can't succeed. Mm -hmm. And then asking very simple questions about, well, what does that picture look like? And, and, and paying attention to how their body moves mm -hmm. once they start telling these stories. Yeah. And absolutely paying very close attention to their breathing. Yeah. So when people go into these stress responses and trap their breath in their chest, we, t we tell this to our coaches all the time and anyone else who will listen as far as uh, uh, people that that facilitate transformation with other people through dialoguing and, and mm -hmm. better storytelling. Good luck changing your client's mind while their breath is trapped in their chest. Yeah. You're going to get the social niceties. You're going to get the nods. You're going to get the smiles. Mm -hmm. And it's literally going in. It's not even going in one ear and out the other. Mm -hmm. It's going right over their head. And even if you get a little bit of malleability there, very likely 
that breath is going to reset once they start telling themselves that same story mm -hmm. that they they had been uh and 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 there you go what do you got you got the same old thing yeah that's so, the hardest part of it's coaching and teaching yeah. and being a therapist is it's not conveying the information the the problem is to to really for a lot of therapists out there that are say working on people's backs or necks or whatever it is, unless they're working with a psychologist, most people like, you know, most people, if they hire a trainer, for example, and the next thing you know, someone's talking to them about their story or their language. Some people don't want to do that. Like I've had many people say to me when I give them my evaluation forms, why are you asking me all these questions about my childhood and about my diet? I just, mm -hmm. I just want to get rid of my back pain. So they actually kind of react uh, almost negatively to it. So it, the point I'm making is is that our our culture has so narrowly confined their sense of everything. Like, why would I want to tell you about my life story when my when I'm here to put muscle on? Or, you know, you know, what I'm saying they don't really have a holistic orientation. For example, how story connects to every single part of your life. You beat me to it. Why? Why does anything that happened and how could and it's even how how could anything in, that happened? How could the divorce when I was seven be influencing my back pain right now? Right. That makes no sense to me. Right. In reality, we both know that they correlate quite frequently. Oh yeah, they more often by far than not. Correct. So what, what I'm interjecting in this situation is is that. The, uh, part of the challenge is, is not just with language, but with so many aspects of culture. We're we're right now in this pandemic, which is forcing us to have to look at how many areas of our lives we've just automated and lived out, even when it's been producing pain and dysfunction and disease and wars for thousands of years. The problem is, is most people don't have the energy to even take care of their bodies and think clearly. So somehow we all have to figure out how do we really slow down. And if, if you, what would be a really fun experiment, I'd love to do this. Maybe this would be good, a good video idea for you guys. If you start listening to political leaders like Biden and, and, uh, Fauci and some of these people and apply what your technology is to what they're saying and ask what happens to anyone that believes this and acts it out. Like I've seen a number of analysis of Biden by psychologists saying, look, this is what's going on. Look at how he's shaking. He's nervous. He's got this twitch. It means he's lying and stuff like that. Be very interesting because, you know, Lao Tzu said the government always reflects the people. So it's easier for us to say it's the government's fault. It's Correct. the CDC's fault. But, but the, the, those organizations are made of people that came right out of the culture. So ultimately, what we're seeing and externalizing is actually ourselves being put into the mirror projected back at us. So my point is, is that it would be very interesting for you to see this analysis that you guys would do on key people that have great influence on people to say, okay, this is what's being projected back at you, but this is also what's coming through you. Or you know, you don't get anything in the mirror, but what's in front of it. It's a, it, you, you nailed it. We've we've to use the word again. We've nailed the personal personal narrative. Mm -hmm. How to map it out, change the words, um, and repeat that. I've just finished. Um, uh, COVID-19 by Klaus Schwab and Thierry Malloray. Well, the first name's already got me nervous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and on, on the plane here, I, I finished a book on the Tavistock Institute. I'm not familiar with them, but yeah, it's, it's, it sounds it's one like of, trouble. It's big time trouble. It's one of the biggest and most successful and most pervasive social engineering institutes in the world. Oh, yes, I have heard of yeah, it. They're, they're out of Social England. engineering. Yeah, look up Tavistock Institute, mm -hmm. everybody. And then um, and then I literally just started a, a, a audio book called The State of Fear. Uh -huh. No, excuse me, A State of Fear. And it's about how the um, uh, the British government weaponized the 
COVID-19 narrative specifically to increase the fear response. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, um, that brings us to a very interesting point of the conversation of something that that we're talking about it uh, because I wanted to talk about it is that, and you said for some people, um, they don't have the time and this, this, this COVID-19 has in the lockdowns and the pandemic, it has, um, exacerbated their victim mentality mm-hmm. for a lot of people. It has mm-hmm. this in my personal and professional opinion, this situation we find ourselves in only makes the, the idea and, and the, the process of cleaning up our own personal stories that much more valuable mm-hmm. because I see that the unresolved, and this happened to me, I'm very happy to, t- to talk about how I got into what most people would call conspiracy theories before I got into working on my own story and what happened. And that happens quite frequently. It made, it took everything and made it that much worse. Mm-hmm. So when someone has a lot of personal, um, we can say trauma or a lot of stories that hold negative emotional charge or are um, supplemental in building and maintaining the victim mentality. And then along comes, uh, a, a very sophisticated and deep weaponized story like COVID-19. Mm-hmm. It hooks into these unresolved emotional, personal stories mm-hmm. and, and exacerbates it also because if someone's breath is trapped in their chest mm-hmm. from, you know, the divorce stories and the abuse stories and the stuff in their own life, quote unquote, smaller picture stuff, less global stuff. Um, and they're already breathing in their chest, then they're going to be even easier to scare. Mm-hmm. They're going to be even easier to scare and then get led down a road, which does go back to political speech. I stare at politics, their language when they talk and present. And it's extreme. These people are, they do very few of them craft their own speeches. Well, I know that yeah. they are, they are very is the smartest engineered they're absolutely engineered constructed and they're ultra seductive and what they do is they get you to make little yeses they get you to agree in Mm -hmm. in, in, in little increments about stuff strategy no we as americans now if we look at that and this is happening on both sides of the fence Mm -hmm. okay which is why i don't like either side of the fence Mm -hmm. right uh it's it's me as a sovereign individual um uh liberating myself from from my own victim mentality. I do that and I got 80 for 80% of my headspace mm-hmm. checked. Mm-hmm. Um, we as Americans, well, if I'm an American, then if I'm not conscious, aware of what's happening there, I'm going to agree on some level mm-hmm. to what they're saying because I'm an American. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we wouldn't do something like that. We wouldn't treat other people like that. And if I think that I'm a good person, now they got me twice because mm-hmm. I'm an American and I'm a good person. And no, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, it's, it's un-American to fill in the blank and they get these little unconscious yeses. And then eventually you've, you've nodded along half can of catatonic for the, the, the length of the speech. And then they hit the, and it's all general. There's very little specific action that they're going to do. It's these big, broad, ultra seductive strokes with their mm-hmm. their storytelling, and it it emotionalizes people and 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 gets them in 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 a camp. Mm-hmm. No pun intended. Uh, <laughs> well, Hitler was very good at all this. <clears throat> yeah, he, he gets it. Of course, he gets it. Um, and and my business partner is very astute. He's way smarter than me when it comes to the the political rhetoric and 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 analyzing that stuff. We've talked about creating courses, uh, to, to help people protect themselves from government narratives. Mm -hmm. Good idea. You know, the thing is, which, which does absolutely a, I had to get this in there. If we do that, there's going to be a front and center component of, listen, if, if you do not negation, acknowledge, clean up your personal stories, then you're going to have an, a really hard time dealing with these big picture stories. Well, yeah, you're going to be swept into it. Exactly. You're going to become a statistic like a lot of people have. I go down to the spa, start learn, start cleaning up my life. And I start, the first thing I start learning about, this is in 2003, 2004. Remember the websites when they had the links on the, the sides of the, mm-hmm. the websites? So I was, uh, I'd, I'd go and I'd research organic food because I want to eat better. And then over on the links, it'd be, it'd be drop some F-bombs, fuck Monsanto. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, huh, what's Monsanto? And I'd get on that website and I'd read and over here, it'd be like, um, you know, fuck Big Pharma. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what's the matter with big pharma? And then I go over there and then get the vaccines. Like, what do you mean? I just got a bunch of them and Japanese encephalitis before I went over to Thailand. Um, and then it's, then it's the Illuminati and then it's David Icke book. So I went from, yeah, uh, uh, 19 hijackers and box cutters and they hate our freedoms and let's go get them to in a short amount of time, three or four months to reading my first David Icke book. Mm-hmm. It's quite the shock. And it was extra shocking because I got into that stuff before I started cleaning up my personal stories. Mm-hmm. The stuff that I told myself about myself, the, the stuff I had was holding against my mom, stuff I was holding against my dad, the guys that bullied me in middle school. You know, all of that stuff was the it's it's the it's the legs for the the tabletop of of these bigger picture spells. They are they're they're the definition of a spell. Everybody, not mine. It's Webster's, a word or a combination of of, of words of great influence. And COVID nineteen is here to kill everybody. And you got to get this this and that. That is a spell. Mm-hmm. It's a scary one. And the more impacted fear based stories people have, well, the easier they're gonna to jump how high when people tell mm-hmm. them to. I go on rants. Well, Well, this is back to the conversation of personal sovereignty. And I forget which one of us mentioned this, but what, uh, what I find interesting in this entire conversation is if you look across most, uh, communities of health and fitness oriented people who are connected to the physical body and understand a bigger picture of what's going on here, Mm -hmm. uh, many of these people do not buy into that larger narrative because they're saying, what the hell? That doesn't make sense. That's not it. That's not going to work. If I'm responsible for my own health and I take these measures and I'm physically healthy, I'm spiritually healthy and I have a good community and I'm eating good food and all all the things we know to be true and we, we opt and choose, the one of the common themes in that is that there is a understanding of your personal narrative and an understanding of the control that you have over your own health, right? Mm-hmm. And your own ability to, to to be a functioning, healthy, happy human. Mm-hmm. And part of that equation is about your mental health and mm-hmm. your spiritual health. We help people to get their personal narrative under control enough and Mm -hmm. understand the structure of how we think and feel that allows them to stay in that place and then expand within it. Mm -hmm. So that is a, uh, in the spell conversation, we can have expansive spells, we can have constrictive spells, COVID-19 as a whole, uh, the way the government is pitching it is a constrictive spell as within, I know deeply within our community of enlifted coaches has been a very expansive spell for many people because it has put them in a place to take more ownership and to uh, prepare more for what we're calling the golden age. (laughs) So we talk about, right, like bringing us back to those deeper human roots and being able to uh, be more self-sustaining, be more uh, building us up rather than falling victim to the narrative and the story. Mm. We have you know, a community of people that are saying, okay, that's what they're saying over here. How can I construct something different? And how can I protect my personal freedoms, protect my personal sovereignty, lean into it farther, build a community that supports me. And it's because they are clear of the victim mentality. They're not falling victim to that storyline. Well, you see, you're always looking through the lens of your own unconscious. So, you know, if you, if you see language like Joe Biden saying you have to take this vaccination or else and you're already in victim mm-hmm. um mentality or you're you're in in the you're you're in the victim archetype then it really just is it's like another father threatening you t- for punishment and so it triggers off Mm-hmm. All sorts of defense mechanisms. 100%. The problem with that, though, is when we're in a situation like we're in in the world right now, it requires creativity. We, we have got to stop saying and doing the same things that led to the problem. Break the pattern. And, and, you know, Einstein said you cannot solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. And that's one of the reasons they want to keep everybody scared because when cortisol levels are high and adrenaline levels are high, you're so pushed into your left brain. And you're so pushed down into your autonomic reptilian and base mammalian survival responses that you're very unlikely to actually be able to say 
something simple like, is this really true? Is it really true that this virus is even real? Uh, is it really true that it came from a lab and we're, you know, and, that, and they're playing with biological weapons that could hurt? I mean, there's a lot of scenarios, right? But to really rationally analyze all that stuff, you can't rationalize it from a state of being triggered and charged. 100%. Because otherwise, what you do is you're actually projecting your own internal infliction into the equation. So it taints the equation. So it's like, um, you know, if you're trying to do a chemical process in a laboratory that has to be pure, but while you're at lunch, someone spits in the test tube, you can't figure out where all this other genetics and, and uh, organisms and stuff's coming from. So it, it confuses the whole thing. So in order for us to really say, okay, what are the ingredients in the test tube of culture right now? We can't keep spitting in the situation or we can never really get down to the core issues that have to be addressed and then say, how do we creatively address this first within ourselves and then step out into our social group or into progressively larger groups but then every time you do that you also have to purify everyone in the group so you see it sets up quite a little bit of a conundrum because the situation that we're in worldwide is going to take all of us to participate to get out of it and if we don't all start really getting honest with ourselves about how we contributed to it with our thoughts, words, and deeds, and our passivity, and being childlike, and trusting authority, and having, you know, infantile beliefs that their best interest is always us. If we don't get past that, then we're... We're, we're in deep shit. We're in deep shit. And, and, um, and, and I personally think that is the damn beauty of all of this. I agree. You know, when... when when if you're out in the woods and you accidentally step in a bear trap and there's nobody around for miles and you your cell phone battery is dead you have two choices no matter how much pain you're in and no matter how bad you're bleeding you've either got to figure out how to get that trap off your leg or you get to die and we've all got a trap on our leg as a world society and it's you know you can put ever whatever label you want as to who's setting the trap but the reality of the spring of it's so big we're all going to have to pull that thing open together but there's no sense even opening the trap because if we get out of the trap and just go do the same shit we're just going to walk into the next one and the next one that's why it's evolution not revolution yes. when i hear somebody go it's time for a revolution it, well guess what here we go again it's com we're coming full yeah. circle we're going to make all the mistakes no it's it's evolution become solutionary become a yeah. solutionary hi everybody hope you're enjoying the show i thought i'd take a minute to sing you a little song dr quiet she is you know how she loves to bring energy in she teaches you how to rest so your energy is always at its best. Hey! And I want to tell you a little secret. You know how I support Dr. Quiet? I use Organifi Gold, and it does some magic to help you sleep deeper and restore better so you can get up and be a freedom fighter first thing in the morning and all through the day. And I got Drew Canoli, who created the product right here, right now, to tell us why it works so well. Drew, what's so unique about Organifi Gold except the fact that my kids won't stop asking for it? I love this song. Thank you. And I think if we were DJing this, we would do Rishi. Because <laughs> Rishi, uh. full spectrum, eight to one, yeah. beta glucans, knock you out. The queen of mushroom. Rishi is one of the most powerful things we can put in our body, especially at night. Helps restore, revitalize. Great for the liver. Yeah. So while we sleep, not only are we restoring and repairing the cells, but we're detoxing in the most effective way possible. Yes. And it doesn't have to taste bad. In fact, it could be something you crave. Yeah. And that's Organifi Gold. It tastes like Autumn had a baby with a marshmallow. Every time I have it, it just knocks me out. I've literally tracked it with my Whoop, my Aura Ring, yeah. and it adds another hour to an hour and a half of deep sleep. That's great. Ram and deep every single night. You know what's also really cool? Rishi is a wise man. Mm. It's not only the name of a mushroom, 
but a rishi is a wise man. Oh, true story. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. It's absolutely true. I'm not so, pulling your leg. And how much wisdom have you and I gained from night school? A Dream lot time. of wisdom. Yep. Yes, and you gain a lot when you can't sleep. You go, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> and how do I get it fixed up? <laughs> so, hey, you know, one time when I was visiting you at your house, you made me a gold, Organifi Gold as a hot tea, and I'd never realized you could make it hot. It's the best way. And I was like blown away. I'm like, wow, this is incredibly good. It tastes like dessert. Mm-hmm. But it, unlike most sweet things, if you take sweet stuff at night, you can't sleep very well and it jacks you up. But this stuff was just so relaxing and so amazing. I was like, wow, this is incredible. And I know you're allergic to coconut. Yeah. Right? So, But what I like to do, and this is when I'm being bad. You see, there's a much bigger cannoli than the cannoli you see today. I I would eat ice cream and all kinds of comfort food because I'm from Michigan. Uh But one thing that put my cravings in check, I take a little cocoa whip. Yeah. I put it on top of this golden tea. Okay. It is the best drink at night you could ever have. It's amazing. I'm intolerant. I'm not allergic. So I did try it. It It just makes me feel stressed. But I found that, you know, if I don't overdo it, I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to have everybody try Organifi Gold because we all need to sleep deep and pay attention to what our soul tells us while we dream so we can work together to Mm. make this world a beautiful place for everybody and get our freedom back and get rid of the toxins in the government and other things we need to do. So it starts with good nutrition. Go to Organifi.com, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com and get your Organifi Gold And while you're there, use the code CHEK20 in all caps to get your 20% discount because we want you on our freedom fighting team right now. Love you guys. Enjoy Organifi Gold. What I was agreeing to when you said this is a beautiful thing, uh, for some people, this is a monumental wake up call. Yeah. And uh, it should be for everybody. And it won't be. Well, it. Of course it won't be because you have to have the energy and the willingness to participate, you know? It's, it's, a, yes. it's like running a group exercise class. One guy over there is doubling the speed because he's running from something. The other one over in the corner is barely doing anything because they're not there because they wanted to be. They're there because their husband told them they were fat and they won't make love to him until they lose some weight. And then there's two or three people in the middle actually following the instructor. And that's always the case. But the, 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 we don't need everybody to be involved. We need enough people to be involved in what you're talking about and what you're teaching. Because when you reach a tipping point, once you get enough conscious minds moving in the same direction, it infuses the energy into, like, it's like dropping a pebble in a pond. The water molecules, 10 feet away don't have to do anything they're going to get hit by the wave and then they're involved so i feel that it's the people like us that are conscious enough to say okay this is my chance to really do my part and when i've done my part i can share what's true for me knowing that i've done my best to to test it and make sure that i've done my research and then what happens is we start getting congruent so a great analogy for this is, you know, when if you go to a clock shop that has 20 or 30 grandfather clocks on the wall, if you knock all the pendulums out of time and then come back two days later, they'll all be swinging in time. Now, many people go, how does that happen? Well, if you understand the physics of it, it's the clock with the largest pendulum that entrains all the other ones. It's got the most mass, therefore it's got the most energy and and it's got the most attractive force, which I show people how that works. If you take a quarter, a nickel, and a dime and put them in a triangle and hang a metal pendulum and just hold it there, it'll start swinging, but it'll always swing most heavily toward the quarter, second most heavily toward the nickel and least toward the dime or the penny. So it shows you how mass has an effect on mass, right? Like the mass of the moon has everything to do with the movement of our tides. If it was too big, we'd be in trouble. If it was too small, we'd be in trouble. So what I'm saying is if we get enough people working together coherently that understand what is the most fundamental that we all need to do 
with regard to managing our thoughts, our words, and our deeds for a greater outcome, then we can pull the other pendulums into line. And those people actually get carried by the rest of us. And so they become the children and we become the parents. And if parents are druggers, then kids become druggies. If parents have no sense of responsibility, kids usually have no sense of responsibility. So if the ones of us that are awake enough to actually start harmonizing together, we can actually pull the others in and create a conscious shift in them by contact. That's where I can argue against what I just said, that it, it, it won't be. If it, if it comes down to everyone needing to get on board and make the, the personal exploration and the changes to their um, behaviors consciously, then we really are in a pickle. Mm-hmm. If it is, and if we, if there are scriptures that, that say that the number is, is, is more like, it's a homeopathic number of people mm-hmm. yeah, that, that, that become aware yeah. and conscious and change their vibration, then, then, and Kimberly very, knows I me, I very say, rarely use the word vibration, <laughs> then, then it does have that, that have, r- that ripple effect that you talked about. One, yeah. one person changing back, their language, yeah. it does, it, it. It infiltrates other people's language. We talk about this with the breath. We use that exact analogy of the entrainment of the clocks. Mm -hmm. And breathing, and this is part of what we facilitate in our coaching certification, is helping coaches to have awareness of their breath. Yeah. And to uh, that your clients, if you're breathing well, and you're breathing, we use the term low and slow, Mm -hmm. into the belly, Mm -hmm. slow, full, complete breaths, your clients that are upregulated and stressed as you're working with them are going to will calm down and match your breath. So yeah. as a coach, it's very important to do that. Yeah. Now, if we look at like a, a practical domino of this, uh, about we, it's great to talk about the theory and the, the, if we all do this together, it's like, okay, well, what are we doing right now? Right. And it's on our side of the street, it's, we're teaching coaches the skill of dismantling the victim mentality, owning their own personal narrative, constructing an identity that serves them training them to have better breathing, more relaxed nervous system, and then go teach that to other people. Mm -hmm. And so it is about that entrainment principle of train better coaches to have a bigger impact and uh, with a system that they can teach and practice with their clients instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Now their clients can go utilize that. And whether it's a health coach, it's a business coach, it's a life coach, doesn't matter, right? Because they're going to take those practical tools, teach them to their clients. Their clients are going to get a better result, become more free thinking, become the owner of their thoughts and become the architect of their lives. And now they're going to go out and ripple and do the same thing. So Mark has created the, he's the rock, the pebble, and then the, we've, spreading it out. And I mean, this is something that happens across people that have, have been students and practice of this work. And it's really beautiful to see on our side of the street is that in their communities, they are that beacon of light. Yeah, They are this person that mm-hmm. leads by example and creates that ripple effect and, and the outreach is happening. And I see that in myself and my communities and, and that are outside. They don't need to know the how of why and how I've gotten clear on that for myself. What they know is how I show up differently mm-hmm. because I speak more solidly mm-hmm. and because I breathe and I'm slow and I am in control of my own construction of the world around me. Mm-hmm. And so they, they do come to match that, right? They, yeah. if you're around somebody who's calm and centered and uh, breathing well, y- you'll match that. Mm-hmm. If if you're around a bunch of frantic people that are f- full of anxiety and stress, that's what they'll match. And that that links right back to the science on mirror neurons. You know, it's it's very easy. Um, y- all you got to do to see that is if you sit to talk with someone and you cross your legs, within a few minutes they'll cross their legs. If you keep scratching the back of your neck, they'll start scratching the back of their neck, and and it's actually thought to be by people like friends dewall and others it's a it's a mode of empathy it's a mode of connection mm. it's a, it's how we fit in right so it, it's uh, what thought came to my mind that i wanted to share before i forget it is i've looked into how many people does it take to be in coherence mm. to create a shift in seven billion people and the number that the scientists that look into this have come up with is about two million when you think about it, that's pretty doable. It really is. I mean, uh, if we can, I mean, it's emotion. 
There's it, two million of us that are that are. It's emotion. How many yeah. downloads did you get in these days, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> downloads for the podcast. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, not two million yet. I have to go. We have to go. You guys need to go sit with Joe Rogan. You'll get your two million. <laughs> but the the um, Paul check just spelled us. He did. <laughs> Hopefully, in a positive way. Very. Uh, he's adding to our spell. We've been spelling to go on Joe Rogan for a bit. Yeah, so. good. You know, the thing the, the thing is, though, is that when I look around and talk to people and I'm in contact with people all over the world, I think what the media shows is really quite an illusion like most of it. Hmm. I think if you could go, like I know in my area here, most people are, are in the same mindset we are. Um, I, I really feel that what's, missing is just the awareness and the realization that people aren't alone in this and that and that there is hope and possibility huge part of it. and that if we use the same technology that's being used against us to connect to each other get our story congruent get clear on what we want together what our dream is and then develop values to guide our thinking our language and our actions so we're all oriented toward what it is that we all need together without racism involved, without belief system involved. I say, well, we all need clean soil. We all need clean water. We all need fresh air. We all need sovereignty and we all need to make room for each other. And, you know, I tell people, look, if you want to get vaccinated, thank you. Go ahead. You're running that side of the experiment for me. I'm the control group. <laughs> and if you really believe in it that strongly, then guess what? We are going to find out in short order it won't be long and you'll either be really grateful because i did the, the control group and can demonstrate to you what it looks like to be a healthy person who trusts themselves and you can demonstrate to me what it looks like to uh, go with whatever you justified and whatever you think the medical system justifies and, and you, you you would never be foolish as a scientist to say whoever's in that group is an idiot those rats are stupid because they're in the control group and those are the smart rats because they're rats and they're both on one side of the experiment and you can't have an experiment without both sides. You, you see the point? I'm is making? it an experiment though? What, uh, <laughs> I'm using it as an analogy. Uh, yes, it is an experiment. Yeah. The whole thing's an experiment. <laughs> we don't want to go down that rabbit hole. We won't get enough talk on your, your program. So, Mark, my, my next question, which you so beautifully set us up for with our previous dialogue, is I believe that conflict is a healthy part and a necessary component of relationship as long as um, we can share our viewpoints and stay connected at the heart with each other. I'd love it if you can elaborate on the three pillars of conflict language that you share in your Enlifted approach. And the reason I'm asking the question is because there's obviously a lot of conflict about many things going on in the world right now, from whether you should or shouldn't get vaccinated, whether our governments are corrupt, our banking system's corrupt, whether AI is safe, whether we should keep going with 5G systems. I mean, the list is very long, as, as both of you know. Um, and it does lead to a lot of conflict. I know even with my own, my own family, only two of us in my whole family other than myself, well, I'm speaking of my my genetic family, like my brothers, sisters, and mother and father, and nieces and nephews. Uh, my my son did not get vaccinated. My niece did not get vaccinated, and I didn't. But everybody else in the family did, even with all the evidence that I gave them. And they actually think that I'm a conspiracy theorist. Okay, so what's happened is, you know, my mother doesn't talk to me. I, I, I hardly have any contact with my family because they think I'm crazy and they even accuse me of spreading misinformation and I've even had close personal friends get upset at me uh, saying that, you know, what I'm doing is very dangerous and that um, they hope that I get shut down and, and people that, you know, used to be people that were very close personal friends. So, you know, when you start dividing a family or dividing your friends and you have this heavy, heavy polarity and you lose connection at the heart, you don't actually make it through a process that's really natural in any kind of a negotiation or resolution of anything. 
And what you get is just more wounding and more capitulation, recapitulation of victim, uh, saboteur, um, you know, immature warrior mentality, kill it, uh, destroy it. Um, so I'm just really curious to hear from you. I would love to hear from you or Kim or both of you. How do we use the concepts that you guys teach personally in our immediate relationships? And how could these concepts be used at the level of government so that we can apply the skills of engaging in conflict with the intention of the best resolution for everybody involved instead of just being right? It starts, <clears throat> so instead of our immediate relationships, it's our immediate relationship, which is the one with ourself. Mm -hmm. And when someone is using <clears throat> what we call conflict language, which entails three main pillars, mm -hmm. language patterns, language pillars. And this comes from, again, paying very close attention to how people uh, tell the story of their problems. Right. When someone uses these language patterns, which I'm about to explain, which also dovetails back into the part of conversation about the practicality of this system, the simplicity and the practicality of it, you, and I can practice thinking, speaking, and writing in different ways. When someone uses a lot of conflict language, Paul, uh, which w prior to ha being called conflict language was called victim mentality language, I'm about to rattle off that, that definition here in a second, people get in a stressed state, back to that again, and the breath is trapped in the chest. And when we go into that, I'm going to sound smart here for a second. It's called <laughs> amygdala hijack. Yeah. And when someone's in amygdala hijack, their listening capacity goes down. Mm -hmm. You talked about this earlier. They, they lose access to their creative faculties. Yes. Literally their peripheral vision. They get tunnel vision fixated on something. Mm -hmm. And anything that comes in contact with that story uh, um, exacerbates the stress response. And people tend to have... Um, they, they have monologues instead of dialogues. Mm -hmm, yeah. So first things first, folks, clean up our own personal language, our stories, and our identity. We will come out of these upregulated sympathetic nervous system response states into parasympathetic nervous system response. The breath, If you stick with it, the breath will descend back down into the abdomen where it should reside most of the time. Mm -hmm. And then we become... Uh, way better listeners, and then that is the seat, in my opinion, of of conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. So, and then people can listen to other points of view, and conversations can be had in the immediate, medium, and long term. And the quote unquote truth or a a a better better story mm -hmm. will will stabilize itself. The three language patterns of conflict language, okay are negations, projections, and soft talk. Ladies, gentlemen, if you're listening uh, to this and you're, you're a note taker, please write these keywords down. So we'll focus on negations first. Very simple stuff. Paul. Yeah, repeat them again. Negations, projections, projections, and soft talk. Yeah. And there's a reason we do soft talk at the end. So negations, my grandmother was uh, a three-time Olympic gold medalist black belt in the art of worrying she was a, <laughs> such a high level worrier i was man. curious what sport it was <laughs> yeah and only once i got into the language game did i realize how what she was doing she just she constantly used negations which forced her to stare at all the stuff that she didn't want mm -hmm. that couldn't keep happening um what she can't keep doing um what's what's not in our best interest mm -hmm. so here are the keywords folks don't won't isn't hasn't haven't, not, shouldn't. First thing my driving teacher said when I got in the car, I said, look where you want to go, buddy, because you're probably going to go there. Yeah. And and here's a great example. I've been using it since 2014 when it happened. And it also puts on the table back to the four aspects of our experience of ourself, imagination, emotions, posture, and breath, how our language, one sentence can activate influence those things instantaneously. I was doing a training up in Calgary uh, uh, for a group of, uh, it was a sales team and I stayed after to do one-on-one -on -one sessions. I'm in a room, 
Myself, young man, 22, 23, he's struggling at work. Two chairs were facing each other. And he goes, Mark, I can't keep focusing on my past. But a lot, if I did, did it like he did, the, the headset would have flipped off. Mm -hmm. He turned around in an instant, a macro body movement, not a little scratch, turned around and looked behind him and then looked back at me. Of course, I saw it. I'm staring right at him. I go, you know, you just turned around and looked behind you, right? And he goes, what? I said, yeah, what'd you see? He had to think about it. I saw myself on the couch and, and all alone. And then I asked him, what are you feeling? Fear and some sadness. And where was he breathing? In his chest. Mm -hmm. So I had him write down that sentence. Mm -hmm. Gave him a pen, the power of the pen. I can't keep focusing on my past. Mm -hmm. And I said, if that's what you can't, because the key word can't, mm -hmm. it, it influenced the rest of the sentence mm -hmm. and forced him to stare at, at his past and not the good stuff, all the fails. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, stress response. I said, if you can't keep focusing on your past, what can you start doing? And again, just like the woman uh, at the, the the workshop when I first saw this stuff, it was such a departure from his normal storytelling process. It was clunky, and it, it took a second for him to get his head around it. And he said, at half of a sentence, he goes, and with, with up talk at the end, focus on my future more? Mm. And I said, yes, now make it a full sentence and be more solid with it. I can focus on my future more. And you see him talking himself into mm -hmm. it. And now say it cleanly. <sighs> Breath, sigh of relief, of pressure coming out of the stress, of staring at all the bads. I can. I can focus on my future more. And then we identified three things for him to do. Get some books, get a mentor, which they offered in the, in, in the, in the organization, and go to the monthly networking events. Mm -hmm. And he wrote me six months later and he said, that one thing allowed me to focus where I wanted to go, stay focused on it. And I've done those things and, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing really well. Mm. That's negations. Okay, so talking about what we don't want, there's a picture of what we don't want. What can't happen, there's a picture of what, again, what we don't want. And, and all that mental imagery, it adds up. Sometimes I'm in a hurry, and in a hurry between engagements, lunch, or dinner, and dinner won't be ready for a while. So I just want to eat something delicious that's quick and easy. And that is when I say, thank God for Paleo Valley. Paleo Valley has extremely high standards and only uses the highest quality, cleanest sources for their animal and plant food products, and they have excellent jerky meats neatly packaged so you can take them anywhere and never be stuck without something great to feed your beautiful body and stabilize your mind. I love their pasture-raised turkey sticks in the original and cranberry orange flavor. Angie Penny and the kids absolutely love their grass-fed beef sticks which come in jalapeno summer sausage, garlic summer sausage, teriyaki, and original flavors. I can assure you Paleo Valley's meat sticks are so good you could literally make a meal of them or have them as snacks and you'd feel satisfied and satiated and know you've fed your body top quality nutrition that will make your cells dance for joy. Yoo-hoo! Paleo Valley has lots of other great additions to meet your food and nutrition needs and their website is loaded with great articles, podcasts, recipes, and more. Go to www.paleovalley.com to get your 15% Living 4D discount. Use the code CHECK15, all small case, C-H-E-K-15 on checkout. The whole family will be satiated, nourished, and glad you did. Then there's projections. This is where, this is where the venom comes from. Mm. This is where the victim villain mental imagery comes from. She never lets me think for myself. If someone says that, there's going to be a person in the picture and them in the picture. They're on the receiving end. Okay, they're some, they're doing something to them. Mm -hmm. um, my 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 husband um, always talks down to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, same thing there. My mother treats me like a child. So those language patterns and here the 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 the, the, the um, uh, key words for projections. He she, they, people's first names, mom, dad, all of that is going to externalize our awareness and find someone to blame for really what we're creating for ourselves mm -hmm. and what we've been creating for ourselves for a long time. Mm -hmm. So when we take out the, you know, my mother talks down to me a lot. Take out mom and put in I. Mm -hmm. oh, shit. I talk down to me a lot. I mean, come on, everybody. Who, who talks more shit to you about you than you? There's not, there's, it's like, there's not even a conversation compared to like the stuff that people say in their heads compared to what other people say. We're, we're our own worst 
trash talker. And talking about conflict again, this is, this is where if you start to change your language, you're going to create different stories and they're going to bump up against into all of the other victim centric stories you've created and your addictions to them. The, the, it, the process is simple in one sense, and it does take some guts to get into our stories and deal with our attachments, mm-hmm. um, especially projections. I mean, that that's you know very confronting. You ruined my life. Take out you, put in, oh, I ruined my life. Whoa. Well, if I ruined my life, well, um, how did I do that? And what could I do differently? It puts us, most people's language, Paul, tricks them into being innocent bystanders in their life. Mm-hmm. It puts them in the stands. Yeah. You want to be in the arena. You want to be the author of your own story for better and for worse. So it's it's not it's not at all personal, uh, you know, you take my, my personal rights. It's personal responsibilities. Okay, let's get more responsible with our storytelling. And here's the easiest part of the whole thing. It's called soft talk. Mm-hmm. Okay, and there's there's about 10 keywords. Think, maybe, like, kind of, sort of, guess, perhaps, probably, should, try. Those words, I guarantee y'all listening to this, they're in your language. And all you coaches out there, these keywords are in your client's language and they're creating indecision, Mm -hmm. they're creating anxiety, Mm -hmm. and they're keeping their ability to get solid about a something and then enact change right at finger's length. So, you know, Paul, I, I probably should spend, you know, more time with my wife. A lot of them are escape words. That's a great way to describe it. Mm-hmm. That's a really great way to describe it. They are escape words. Yeah. You know, I think I'm drinking too much. No, guess what? If you say that, you know you are. Mm-hmm. N- take out the think, get mm-hmm. solid with it. Now now you're not thinking about something you're doing. You're owning what's happening. And it also it does force the issue of uh, change is scary. Mm-hmm. Okay. Also, if it's something that you're you're looking to do like a, like a large goal, you know, I, I probably want to start my own business. People can protect themselves. So it's escape language. It's also protective protection language. Mm-hmm. Cause if I start my own business, no, I am going to start my own business and I go and I fail, then that's going to be more proof for the telephobia, the fear mm-hmm. of not being good enough. Mm-hmm. So people use this language and it's, it's easy to start with soft talk because all you have to do is take it out. Mm-hmm. And here's one of my unlifted promises. If you take out 50% of your soft talk, and again, I'm, I promise you, it's in your language. If you cut your soft talk by 50%, you will increase your confidence by 200%. Mm-hmm. You'll double your confidence. And, um, and that's a big deal. That's something that you can feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you also, you also basically, <clears throat> if you do that, you're simultaneously initiating an act of responsibility. 100%. Because you're not going to take that soft talk out unless you're ready for the responsibility of managing your the power of your thoughts, words, and the actions that result from them. And I think, personally, that's one of the challenges we have in the world is we, we have so many people that have not become adult with their relationship with themselves and, and their relationships that people are avoiding responsibility because they want someone else to take care of them or make their life better or clean their bedroom or, you know, they want to win the lottery. They don't want to do the work to become successful. They want to just win the lottery. So I, I think, uh, you know, we've, we, we're, we can't keep escaping ourselves and each other and we have to start taking responsibility for what we are creating individually and collectively uh, because we just, we've kind of, the the candle uh, the the wick is burning out you know quick and on the other side of that fence if someone wants to take more responsibility in their life they want to um empower themselves they want to shrink the imposter syndrome they want to uh shrink the victim mentality that's a great intention if they're using those keywords those langu- whether they like it or not they're going to script those stories so mm-hmm. if someone wants to be more confident take more responsibility, yet their language is riddled with soft talk, Mm -hmm. regardless of their intention, they're getting the anxiety and and indecision. And before soft talk, 2015, we we launched Core Language Upgrade, which was our flagship online training course. 
And we had to reshoot that thing, which was no small feat for two dudes bootstrapping a company. We reshot that course because before conflict language was called conflict language, it was called victim mentality language, Mm -hmm. which we were accurate in our assessment. That's too strong of a place to start the conversation and, and very accurate for the, 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 the language patterning for the definition of the victim mentality. So this is another thing to write down folks here. I'm taking a little bit out of the middle. Here's the verbatim definition of the victim mentality. The victim mentality is an acquired personality trait where a person tends to regard himself or herself as the victim of the negative actions of others, even in the absence of clear evidence. The victim mentality depends, as in it has to have, the victim mentality depends on a habitual thought process. Mm Mm-hmm. Habitual accurately implies duration and addiction. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so if that's the definition, then what what are the what are the thought processes? What are the words? Mm-hmm. Those are that's a lot of the words right there. That's that's eighty-five, roughly eighty-five percent of the key words that people use to keep their victim centricities uh in place, trap their breath, create the heavy, dense feelings. You know, I'm 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 burdened, I've got the weight of the world on my shoulders i'm down in the dumps we can create very dense energies for ourselves, mm-hmm. and getting out of that well i mean there's a variety of ways to do it and our story our personal story which is built up of words particular words that's one of the most important components of of freeing yourself from uh, uh chaos in your head and in your heart. And then back to what you were saying about conflict, um, having, having a lot of victim stories, that, that takes up very valuable mental real estate. It's extremely noisy. Someone, like you said, you get around someone who's very emotional. It's, it's staticky. It's, it's, it's prickly. You can, you can feel it coming off people. Good luck getting a, a, a better conversation through all that into them while they're very upregulated. Mm-hmm. So, it's, this is a process of downregulating ourself. Clarity and space. Those are two words that we use synonymously with the Enlifted system. Uh, and, and it absolutely, Enlifted method, it delivers more clarity and more space to people. And everything gets better from there. That's my answer, uh, Kimberly. I think Mark, what Mark just summarized is the, the system. And to directly go into the the application of the system in conflict resolution or in in the bigger picture it's i agree that it starts with ourselves the relationship with ourselves and when a person can master their language and their understanding of themselves it allows for more ownership of their side of the equation and going into then resolving a conflict with another person it is a much it's an easier conversation to have because you're honest with yourself and you're honest with your own dialogue and you can take ownership for the pieces where you are at fault and you can recognize how to more clearly indicate what your needs and desires and wants are because you can speak affirmatively. Mm -hmm. So Mark outlined conflict language and the other side to that coin is the architect language, which is our solid talk, removing the soft talk keywords, uh, affirmations, the opposite of the negations. Uh, I do want you to be uh, at dinner at 7 p.m. versus you're never here on time for dinner. So, we're, you know, like it's... <laughs> Hello, fist fight. Yeah, and there's very clear application of of translating the conflict language into the architect language that allows us, the other person, to be much more clear about what it is that we are seeking from them. Mm-hmm. And then the... Uh, the projections, the opposite is the reflection. And that's the key piece that many people require in conflict resolution is to look in the mirror and say, where do I need to take ownership for this? And how do I fit into this equation? So when we can have a more honest dialogue with ourselves, we can drop into the heart and we can feel through the emotions and the the connection, right? Because what, uh, Paul, I believe the way you put it was that to connect through the heart to resolve the conflict versus the um, the noise of the anger, frustration, emotions that are driving the conflict to begin with. Yeah. So when when the breathing is upregulated, when the stress response is on, you know, good luck listening, good luck hearing, but also good luck hearing your own heart and feeling into that. 
because it's blocked. Mm -hmm. It's completely blocked by the stress. Mm -hmm. So when we can get the story clear in our head and recognize our own internal dialogue that's fueling the frustration, the anger, the conflict, and then say, all right, how can I translate this? It's like, he's never on time for dinner. Okay, well, what time do I want him to be there? What time, you know, am I expecting? Okay, I, you know, and then bringing that to your partner or bringing that to the person and saying, I would like you to be here at 7 p.m. so that we can eat together and share this time. And I would like that your uh, your phone is away and you're present with me versus you always show up to dinner late. You're always on your phone. You're never done with the work. We always come in the house all frustrated. Like tell them what you want mm -hmm. versus telling them yeah. what they're what they're doing wrong because they don't, you can tell somebody what they're doing wrong all day, but if they don't know where you want them to go, mm -hmm. how are you going to lead them there? Yeah. And nonviolent communication, that's called making a specific request. Mm. Mm. So because most people are wishy-washy or- they, Soft talk. Yeah. They're assuming that the other person has read their mind. Mm -hmm. um, and they haven't even read their own mind. No. Yeah. And I think too that- when it comes to staying connected at the heart, w just my own explorations of this is, the, and this is how I, one of the ways I do it, if, if I'm feeling myself irritated or triggered, if I say to myself, I'm really curious to understand their viewpoint versus I can't fucking believe how stupid stupid that is or you want to play a language game paul uh, i can't believe to. yeah so yeah. i can't believe is a key phrase that we hear people say often right i can't yeah. believe they did that yeah i can't believe she didn't show up well did it happen it, yeah then you can believe it you can believe it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly and then when you put it in that way right the inflammation of i can't believe yeah. is so uh dramatic yeah but it happened so i can believe it and if I can believe it, I can get some space from it. Yeah, I become more objective. Yeah, what I'm saying is, is it's easy to reject somebody because it makes it easier to hold your opposing viewpoint or to victimize them. But if I, what I find is, if it, if I let that make me curious, well, that's a very interesting way to see the world, or that's a very interesting way to. Uh, see a political view or wh whatever the issue is, I just find that if I allow myself to really be genuinely interested in what their inner perception is, what their experience is, then I need to stay connected because in order to resolve the curiosity, I have to keep my attention on them but I can't make a judgment or I won't know what it is that I'm looking for. In other words, a scientist can't predetermine the outcome of an experiment or they're not doing science. Pfizer can. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and Fauci and people like that, but... I had to. You, under, you understand what I'm saying? Like, if I'm... Like, if you're going to go on a blind date and you've already decided that the person's unattractive and uninteresting before you've met them, yeah. then the date's already over. But if you say, wow, I'm really curious about this person. It's a level of empathy. And it's different yeah. words. And it's connection. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. different words. It creates a more open, receptive yeah. uh, ability to inquire, right? Mm -hmm. Those and words, uh, uh, that's an interesting way to see the situation. Those facilitate your curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, I can't believe they da 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 da, -da again. Mm -hmm. That's inflammation. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, you're not, those are two different sets of words, two different spells, two different outcomes. It's also a, uh, it's also a judgment that's closed ended because you've already come mm -hmm. to your own conclusion. Well, good point. Very which good means point. you're not in a relationship. You've, you're, you're not in a relationship. You're sitting across from somebody, but to the, to, to, once you make a closed decision like that, you've excluded them from the process. Yeah. And that, usually triggers people because they don't feel heard. And they feel they're attacked. And if they don't feel heard and they feel attacked, when people don't feel heard, they keep repeating and repeating and repeating until they get eye contact. And this is why in nonviolent communication, they have a process where they ask you to, they, like say I, I said, 
honey, would, would you mind having dinner ready for me at six o'clock tonight? Because I have to work a little late because I got a podcast. And then if I have any sense that maybe she's not listening because she's stirring a pot or she's working in the garden, I say, would you mind repeating back what you just heard me say so I'm sure we're on the same sheet of music? Yes, you said you'd like dinner at six o'clock. Okay, thanks. That way I know if it's not ready at six o'clock, then something happened, meaning maybe she couldn't find her keys or whatever. You know, I don't know, but it could be anything. But if if you ask someone to do something and they don't repeat it back, then what you're doing is you're assuming that they actually heard you and that they understood you. And, you know, and those kinds of assumptions are very, very dangerous, especially if it's something important. And, you know, the issues of the world are getting to be quite important. And the issues of the world turn out to be issues of people. So no matter how big the issues of the world are, they always are issues of people. And issues of people are always issues of relationships. And issues of relationships are always 50% me and 50% you. And if we take ownership of our 50%, which is all we can do, at least we know we're making progress at some level because there's 50% of the relationship that's handled effectively. And so yeah, it's, it's just, I asked that question because I think all the conflict going on in the world and families, friends, and relationships over these heavily polarized issues. And what happens is if, if you don't stay connected, and, and, and I know you'll, you'll have already seen this, then what happens is we start projecting our lack of connection and our fear and our victim mentality out, and we start identifying other targets to distract us from having to deal with our own pain, fear, insecurity. And so then what do you see? You see racism, sexism, you see all these sideshows going on. It's like, oh, so-and-so this, so-and-so that. I'm like... That's the reticular activating system. I'm like, look, why are, you, why, why are you getting into issues of racism and sexism when we've got issues of life and death on the plate? Unless you are actually so afraid to, or, or so insecure about doing your own part that you need a distraction... And so we see all these smoke screens going on, which, which I think are at this time are very, very dangerous because um, if it comes to a choice between do I have food, do I have water, do I have safety, shelter, warmth, and racism, if the answer is I don't have food, water, safety, shelter, or warmth, then your enemy can become your best friend because when they're starving to death, and you're the one that has food or water, they'll be your friend. And if they have food or water, you'll forget about what color their skin is to start begging. So what I'm trying to say is that we've got to get past these petty differences and we've got to stop participating in some orchestrated and some self-generated distraction games so we can really focus on the ball, so to speak. You know, like you said, your driver instructor said, you're probably going to go where you're looking. Yeah. We got to start looking at the real issues that are important for all of us in the world. And, and it has to start with a practice because to deal with big issues, you got to start mastering the little ones, right? A thousand percent. You don't go in the gym and, and learn to deadlift with 500 pounds on the bar. You start with an empty bar. And once you got your form right, you add a little bit of weight. And then a few years later, you look at the bar and you go, wow, look at all those plates on there. So when it comes to issues of of vaccination or issues of, of moral obligation or issues of political correctness or scientific validity, these are big issues. But if you if you haven't done those evaluations within yourself, then you don't you're not really clean enough to determine the truth from falsehood at any level. Hundred percent. You want somewhere to start, everybody? Start with your own story. And you'll be surprised at what you can do there and, and, and the impact that you can have in your immediate spheres. It's very empowering. Yeah. And bringing it back to the, the conflict component within our relationships, 
if you study this system and you become clear in your own story and you understand the language patterns, you create more empathy for those that you're communicating with. Yeah. Because you can understand, right? Because it comes back to there's an image in my head, there's a feeling in my body, and then the words that are attached to that. Mm -hmm. The external communication of what we're saying to each other, and then also the internal communication that I'm having with myself. And if I can master my own narrative and dialogue, that's part, you know, piece of it. Part two of it is understanding the keywords in the system of what you say back to me. Yes. So if I can in decode a little bit of what you're saying and put myself in a place where I can be curious and I can imagine what the mental image in your head might be while you're while we're in this dialogue or conflict, it helps me connect to you more. Mm-hmm. Because it's if you're projecting onto me, now I can come from a cooler place rather than taking offense to the things that you're pointing and put, you know, it's my fault rather than being upset by it. I can say, oh, he believes that this is me when if I can, in my own mind, reflect back the pattern for himself, it's like, I can understand a little bit more where you're coming from, Mm -hmm. or I can connect to you better and I can have more empathy for your experience Mm -hmm. because I'm understanding your emotions. I'm understanding the picture in your head. Mm -hmm. And from there we can resolve together because I can, I can be curious and I can imagine where you're at. Mm -hmm. So now I've got my own internal resolution and then I have the empathy, the component of empathy in understanding the patterns Mm -hmm. and then we can come together and we can resolve. Yes. And if two people know the system, you're golden. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And even even if one person does, you know, if I sit across the table from someone and they are in there, I can, I can very easily, if I can do it, anybody can do it, track their language and know why they're seeing things the way they're seeing them, Mm -hmm. which is a greater depth of understanding into the the, their storytelling mechanics, um, and it also takes a lot of the a lot of that off of me. I'm, it's 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 a whole lot easier to quote unquote not take something personally, negation acknowledged, when I know what l- what words have them stuck. Yeah, yeah, because it it uh, it helps you perceive what the world and the situation must look and feel like to them. Yes. Nick, you said it better than we did. Yes. Yeah, well, it's just, you know, if someone says I'm depressed, well, then you know they're not seeing the same level of sunshine that you are. So. And you can imagine what it feels like for them. Yeah, you can have empathy for that person. P3OM by Bioptimizers is hands down one of the most important supplements to have on you everywhere you go. If you're traveling, if you go to work, if you're going to friend's house to eat, this product will knock out food poisoning and almost any kind of gut disorder from viruses, bacteria, fungi, whatever could irritate your gut so quickly. It's mind blowing. I have been using this product since Wade Lightheart first turned me on to it, and he's the formulator of it. And I've got Wade here to tell us how it works, but I just want you to hear it from me. I have all my clients use this. I try to get it to friends, to family members, because it is really like your own bodyguard. So Wade, how in the world does this thing work so well every time? Well, as you know, we're very research oriented and we have literally a university in Croatia that we do microbiome testing with our labs of PhDs to find out what's the most effective formulation. And we are quickly moving into the post antibiotic world where we need to cultivate super probiotics. We all heard of super bad bacteria in hospitals and stuff that are antibiotic resistance. Well, what we did, we worked with a medical doctor that was able to take an aggressive strain of L plantarum, which is a very aggressive strain, and then put it through almost like a buds camp, a Navy SEALs training where we subjected this particular probiotic to a toxic environment. We ran a sine wave through it. And out of that survived only about somewhere between two and 3%. We then take that and grow it on very special food. We feed them just like you would feed a great athlete. You feed them special food and the probiotics develop unique capabilities. We have a U.S. patent that is so powerful. I can't read it on the airwaves because we'd get canceled. 
But what I can say is when you put P3OM in your body, it goes out and breaks down any undigested protein, whether it's in your gut or through your blood system. And it becomes your Navy SEALs defense force, if you will, to go out and wipe out whatever pathogen might come in your body. You just need more of these guys to overwhelm it. It takes it out. It cleans up any messes. And for the last 18 years, I've been using P3OM daily. And I can honestly say, I've never been sick during that time. If I feel something coming on, I just double down my dosage, take four caps every night. If I get a little, if I'm traveling, I take twice that. And it's been great. A lot of our people do it. And it's one of our best selling products. And it's available to your audience. Just go to p3om.com slash living40. Put in Paul 10, get a 10% discount. And if it's not the best probiotic you've ever had in your life, you get 100% of your money back. That's from us at Bioptimizers. That's our guarantee for you. Go get it. It's for real. I love the stuff. Thank you, Wade. You know, when it comes to story, uh, it's one thing to write your story down and another issue altogether to embody your story. I'm wondering what methods you use to help people embody their story so it's aligned with their life, dream, goals, objectives, and values. Um. And I'm curious, how do values in your system relate to uh, one's story? It comes down to what what do you want to shrink, what do you want to expand? So most people's story is a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. There's part of them that is bought into them succeeding, okay? The things they want to do, the parts of them that believe in themselves enough to go out and give it a shot. And then there's the part of them that uh, believes that they're not good enough, mm-hmm. that's bought into them failing, that's trying to keep them from, from, from going out there and, and getting in the arena and competing. One is um, uh, uh, a, a victim mindset, and one is what we call an architect mindset. Mm-hmm. And so in order to shrink, and if roughly speaking, 80-20, if you get 80%, Please, let me, important side note, please folks, do not, and I used to do this, do not buy into the story that you need to be 100% awesome in your story and healed before you move forward and Mm -hmm. do some great things with your life. I I know plenty of people that that have uh, um, 80% of them bought in, roughly, it goes, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. They go off and do some great stuff. That's plenty of, 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 uh, you get that amount of you. In, in, in the driver's seat, you're going to go somewhere. You, so you want to shrink down the victim mentality and you want to expand the architect mentality. And, and here's, that's the, that's the big picture answer. The specific answer is something called the four-step story work process. Okay, there's four steps to it. Again, over here, Mr. Simple. First things first, most people have not written out, and we're not talking about journaling about how I feel about the thing that happened back then. I'm talking about writing out a specific event in someone's life that still holds an emotional charge. Mm -hmm. That is very rarely done. What you want to do is you want to get to the specific events, and the magic number is five. If someone, four steps, I'm going to break that down right now, the five most painful stories that they have in their personal story, they they are going to open up so much space in them on a psychological and emotional level, they'll be shocked. Okay, and this stuff is super easy to do. So, so maybe it's a divorce, and then there's a particular abuse, um, and then there's a failed business. You take the 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 you go for the divorce. You write the title down and write it out. Again, most people keep their stories of ouch and pain and woe to themselves in their head. It's the seemingly infinite thing that where does it start? Where does it stop? There's the worst part, <clears throat> a stress response, and I do the whole thing over again. Okay. And even for on a coaching side, even for a a talented coach, in my opinion, it's hard to get to the core of the story that that one sentence that's holding it all together, Mm -hmm. dialoguing it. So, what we do, write the thing down, folks, write it down and write it out in full sentences, full punctuation, and err on the side of detail. Okay. Step one now you've externalized that story, it has a beginning, it has an ending, and you or you and the person you're working with, whether they're your coach or you're their coach, are you're looking at the same configuration of words. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of conjecture out of it. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Step one, write it down. Step two, say it. Read verbatim what's on the paper and allow we in and lifted the terminologies. Let it happen. Let yourself have the emotional response if there is one. Cool. Step two or three, read the same story at 70% of your normal rate of speech. Mm -hmm. So when someone slows down their rate of speech, the breath begins to descend down into the abdomen. Okay. Breath descends, feels come up. Mm -hmm. And then part four, step four is where, uh, at each period, that's the quick and dirty version, at each period, you stop and take a big inhale and a, a big inhalation and a big exhalation. So you're, you're externalizing the story, you're verbalizing it, you're verbalizing it slow, and then even slower with the breath in there. Mm-hmm. And what that's going to do, mechanically speaking, is a story kept in the head, breath trapped in the chest, that picture is in your face. Wherever you go, there it is. As we externalize it and the breath descends, again, mechanics of storytelling, the picture moves out and and now I can see all the other things going on, okay? This is subjective. This is objective. Mm. This is personal. This is impersonal. And one of the beautiful things about this, along with its simplicity, is that as a coach, I don't have to know more about my client than they do. Because when someone does this with their story, they zoom out. They're going to change their mind on their own 99% of the time, and it's going to stick because they came up with it, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, and, and so that's right there. We're open source with our coaching technology, Paul. We do a lot of workshops for the public, and they're all done on a show-and-tell uh, um, format, which yeah. is we coach and teach at the same time for a couple of reasons. One, it's just good to do. We like the, we like being generous. Um, it's got the, we're, we're by that, we're that way naturally and by design. It creates a lot of warmth and good juju. And two, we're super confident with our technology. I'll put as far as storytelling and creating better stories and helping people resolve emotional stuckness, uh, and, and, and the victim mentality, I'll put this up against anything that's out there. Yeah, that's good. And then the second thing, uh, so that will shrink. If you do that with your five most painful stories, that's going to take, it's going to take a bite out of crime, folks. It's going to shrink the victim mentality. And then on the other side of the street, it's the same piece of technology. Write down and verbalize and verbalize slow and verbalize with breath. So you four step your five biggest wins. Mm-hmm. And what that's going to, most people have a problem taking a compliment. Yeah. Okay. And very rarely, I know this is, this is taking a compliment on steroids. This is you accepting the times that you've got it right, that you did well. And what that's going to do is it, it's going to help you re-identify yourself as someone that does go out there and, and, you know, take some chances and get some, get some things right. It's called celebrating the wins. Mm-hmm. So you want to shrink this part and you want to expand this part. And a little bit of that goes a long way. I've used the four-step process. It's the, it's the centerpiece of our coaching technology okay? because it's so versatile and it's been used so much. I've used it on everything between war crimes and torture and simple procrastination and a variety of other things in between because it works on the mechanics. Yeah. The mechanics of storytelling. Excellent. Uh, Mark, in my teachings at the Czech Institute and within my PPS program, in my work with patients and clients, I, offer, I often refer to uh, Ken Wilber's concept that he refers to as the story gap. And I define it this way. The greater the gap between the story you tell others and the story you tell yourself, the greater the likelihood of fatigue, illness, and disease. So to, to make that clear, if I tell you I'm super successful at something, but I'm really not, And then you ask me to get on stage and do it, and I'm scared to death, or it's my new job and I have to do it every day, that can create so much stress that it could really have health effects on me, or even psychological effects, or a person could really like have an anxiety issue. And then the person that hired them is like, what the hell's going on? You know, this guy told me he's a lot of experience at this. Or if you keep telling all your friends that you're really wealthy, but then they realize that the way you live is like someone who's broke, 
and then someone finds out you don't have any money at all, then everybody around you doesn't trust you anymore. And there's a million examples of a story gap, you know. Um, I'm curious from your perspective or both of you from your perspective of what you teach, what, what are your thoughts about the story gap concept and, and what are your, how do you help people address that? So in my book, the story gap is very close to imposter syndrome. Uh huh. So one of the biggest things that we address is getting clear on the internal story and making it match the external story, yeah. being able to speak into bringing them so that there is no story gap mm -hmm. is what we're facilitating and correcting for. Yes. And oftentimes because we're working with people that are in fact successful and knowledgeable and have a high level of performance and achievement, typically the story gap they're experiencing is a disconnect with within themselves and what others perceive. Mm -hmm. So they may be, be a very well studied and credentialed coach and their internal dialogue is telling them, who am I to teach this to other people? Right. Why would anyone listen to me? Mm -hmm. Am I even any good at this? Mm -hmm. uh, and they question and they self-doubt and there's this big gap of imposter syndrome. And when you look at the language patterns of that and you can hear the specific thoughts and phrases that come up and the those connections to our identity about not truly believing that I'm a great coach or that I'm capable of supporting and helping other people, then that's going to get in your way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And so we address that through working people through the imposter syndrome and looking at the conflict language that perpetuates the imposter syndrome, which is a close cousin of victim mentality. Mm -hmm. It's also, um, it's also really in my observation of working with so many people it has a lot to do with insecurity and people who as children um, didn't get enough support and acknowledgement. So they have to compensate by magnifying themselves so that they can get some sense of value, like feel valued or feel wanted or needed. And it can work for them if they're in a situation like a bunch of people just hanging out at a party or a dinner table saying, you know, how many tournaments did you win in martial arts and nobody really knows the truth or how strong are you or, you know, whatever, you know, the kinds of this like blah, blah social conversations. But if that habit gets to where there's a real objective measure of performance and responsibility and the person doesn't realize that they've just set themselves up for a legitimate evaluation <laughs> it can really lead to a crisis you know um but so my point was is that I, I i often see when i see a story gap i almost always have to go back to the early stressful events in childhood to see what was the um well you know what what's the level of attachment or bonding with the parents and what is their attachment style because once I know what the attachment style is, then I can see the strategy that they're using. Because it's it's really an attempt to validate themselves. They're seeking the feeling. So the um, so what's interesting is the this story gap moves in both directions. So we have the 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 truth. I'm stretching the truth and to present myself as bigger and more valuable and more capable than I am. And then we have the other direction, which is I don't believe I'm as capable and competent and successful as I am. Mm -hmm. And those can exist at the same time yes. in a lot of ways. So when we aim to bring those stories closer together, it's a matter of identity mm -hmm. and repping and understanding how to construct our identity to match what, where we want to go. Yes. So it's, it's a common uh, setting yourself up to get to a high level of achievement. You need to have the identity of a person who can. Yes. Now, if you have wounding in your childhood of stories and beliefs and patterns and behaviors that were uh, portrayed to you that you're not good enough, that you're never going to be successful, um, and whether it was a traumatic event or just conversation that your parents would tell you something you got from a teacher that that event stings right mm -hmm. that tra and we can call it a traumatic story it may not be capital t trauma but it, it's a belief you hold about yourself then that feeling that you 
gained as a child or in those early years sticks with you. And that when that imposter syndrome comes up, we feel the same feeling that we felt at the moment of the trauma. Yeah. And so in our method, what we do is we go back to that moment of that story and we do the four-step process on it and give people the chance to release the feeling, give Mm -hmm. people the opportunity to get in touch with, wow, when I go to make this presentation and I doubt myself, it really comes back to the time when I was in school and I had to stand up in front of the room and present my homework and I was laughed at. Mm -hmm. So those, that's the root. And we go back to the root and we address it there. Once we clear it out, now we can do that other process of celebrating the wins to architect the identity of the person who can give world-class presentations Mm -hmm. and can speak on a podcast and can articulate Mm -hmm. with confidence. And there's no question mark in their head if they're good enough or if they're capable of it because we cleared that. Or we've been able to at least make friends with it and understand where it came from and Mm -hmm. feel that feeling. Say, okay, right, cool. Let me get my breathing under control. Let me put my attention on where I want to go. Let me close my story gap. And mm-hmm. be where I am. Yes. And show up confidently. You both nailed it. <clears throat> Imposter syndrome, story gap, call it what you want. The a, a vast majority of that comes from unresolved childhood stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I want to jump forward in their list of questions because you're a big guy on affirmations and supercharging affirmations. And I think because so many of these story gaps root back to issues of insecurity, I find that an affirmation used properly can really help bring a person into the right mental framework to perceive themselves in ways that not only, it's not just perceiving yourself as capable, but it is part of a process of being capable of doing the necessary work to prepare yourself and develop yourself. Because if a person just shows up on stage, let's say, and they've got an affirmation, I'm really, really good, I'm really, really good, I'm really, really good, but they're really, really not, then that's just an affirmation that's like bullshitting themselves. And they might get laughed out again. So maybe you can share how do you feel affirmations can be used not only for a story gap, but any other application you'd like to share? Sure. Affirmations are fantastic. And um, to supercharge them, okay, which is what we call it, it's a very simple process and it's very rarely done, which is affirmations. Most people that use them have written, have them written down <clears throat> and you you highlighted the problem a moment ago when you said, I'm really, really good. I'm really, really good. I'm really, really good. You know what the problem there is, Paul? You don't believe it. (laughs) And the reason that a part of them doesn't believe it or a majority of them doesn't believe it, even though they want to believe it, is because of how fast they're doing it. Mm. I'm really, really good. I'm really, really good. I'm really, really good. Take your affirmations, folks, and do one more thing with them. Stop in between each affirmation and take a big breath in mm-hmm. and a big breath out. Because mm-hmm. look at, look at the, and again, this goes to the mechanics of storytelling. Most people, they're using an affirmation because they want to believe in that more strongly, which uh, uh, also says that part of them doesn't believe that. Yeah. Okay. And so the part of them that is at odds with them believing that and becoming the person that is really, really good or whatever the affirmation is, is going to be in a stress state about it. Yeah. And the breath is going to be trapped in the chest. And then I repeat it too fast. I'm really, really good. I'm really, really good. I'm really, really good. And the whole thing, it's just, it's a head job. It just remains Mm -hmm. here. So what you want to do when you supercharge an affirmation, like I just said, you stop and you can, let's say you have a list of 10 different affirmations. It will work with those, or you can pick one and rep that. Mm -hmm. You stop. And when you get the breath in between each sentence, it's known as socializing the idea, embodying the concept. Or taking it to heart. And what you want to do with the affirmations that you want to bring on board and bring to life and have expand that architect mentality, you want to work with them with your breath, very important, until it's a matter of fact, Mm -hmm. until you feel it. It's a matter of fact, because when the breath gets involved, it turns into, you bring the whole part of your being. You, you, you literally get it into your, you, 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 you generate the feeling that's connected to knowing 
and believing that statement. And then once it's matter of fact, once you've repped it enough to where it's like, oh yeah, I am, I'm really, really good. Move on. Mm -hmm. You're good. You're good. That right there, we, I had a Facebook group for almost a year where we did a live uh, class once a week. It was called supercharge your affirmations. And that's all we would do is get them to write it down and make sure folks it's, um, the affirmation is practical, as in you can practice repeating it easily. You've seen this. How many times have you seen somebody with an affirmation that's basically a small paragraph yeah. and there's 19 different things in it? It's too confusing. You want to simplify and clarify, distill the thing down to a very practical, short and sweet sentence, and then rep it with your good breathing mm -hmm. and watch what happens. I also think that an affirmation can be supercharged to use your term when it's coupled with visualization mm. so instead of just saying i'm really really good at public speaking as you're saying it see yourself standing on stage being confident in yourself delivering well because i think that when you take it from pure audio content into video or visual you're activating more neurons you're you're getting more neural association because you're activating the visual system, not just the linguistic centers of the brain. And, you know, when I was doing uh, EMG training, I, I did uh, a very comprehensive course in EMG training many years ago when I was really doing a lot of hardcore rehab because I had all these patients with, you know, serious injuries and, and um, muscles that weren't working and discs that were compressing nerves. So I had to do a lot of EMG assessment. But one of the things that we did is we took, I believe it was a 32 channel EMG and we would hook it up all along the spine and, and many different muscles all over the body. And then we would do things like visualize that you're climbing stairs and the person would just even be sitting in a chair, but usually just standing. And you can actually watch all the muscles that are used to climb stairs turn on. Mm and say, uh, visualize yourself throwing a ball, and you can actually see all those muscles turn on. So the visual centers actually prime the motor system. Um, an interesting story I'll share with you, I, I was reading a biography, of, I, I think the guy's name was Dennis Coffey, and he was an officer in Vietnam, and he got captured by the Vietnamese, Vietnamese and, he was, and he was in prison and tortured almost daily for seven years. And he talked about one of the ways that he survived it was he was a lover of golf and he would go play golf on, uh, in an, um, and he would just go to all of his favorite golf courses in his mind and play golf. And when he got home, after he got released from the prisoner of war camp and went home, he went to play his first golf game in, in by that time, eight years. And on his first game, he had improved his game golf game by 10 strokes, which really shocked him. But the only explanation was he had been playing golf for, for eight years in prison. And so it shows how activating the visual centers actually entrains the motor centers and most people wouldn't visualize themselves playing a shitty game. They would say, ah, oh, look, I got a hole in one. Or, you know, look, at I, I won the game, you know. So I, I, I just, when, in my own life, I, I try to maximize all the neural pathways by using each of the possibilities. So if you, I just think visualization, whenever possible, um, coupled with your techniques, I think can really take a person a long way. Because if you, prime the system it can't tell the difference between practicing with the golf club in your hand and practicing with it in the mind hand we, yeah we have some fun like ways of the language influences our imagination is yeah. the core of that so the the way that we can use the words another layer of supercharging the affirmations is past tense them oh, yes it's like, like it's like already it already it. did it we yeah. already happened and uh it was great. We crushed it. You know, yeah. we, uh, putting the, putting it into the achievement phase and what, what is great about the system of including the breath is the breath allows the space. I would 
I would guess that most people consciously or unconsciously in that breath are doing the visualization of what it is that that affirmation means to them yeah, because be. it's so slow that you feel and you see mm-hmm. what it is that you're declaring. Yeah, good. The breath. Will, it's the feeling and the visual. The inclusion of the breath with affirmation will detail the mental imagery. Yeah. Because it's more believable. It's easier to see. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm really, really good. I'm really, really good. I'm really, really good with big eyeballs, like all puckered up. That's going to be hard for me to see that in my imagination. Well, not only that, the movie's running so fast. It's, exactly. it's just a blur. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show, and I've got something great to share with you. I think you've all heard plenty in the news about zinc, but what you haven't heard about is Symbiotica's amazing new zinc complex, which is all organic and a unique formulation. And so because Shervin's the expert and the formulator and the founder of Symbiotica, I brought him in to tell us about the zinc complex and when we know we should use it because of the symptoms we're having. So, Shervin, how do we know we need this complex? You know, zinc, I'm a mineral guy. Yeah, you know? I know. <laughs> it's Thank like, God. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. I mean, minerals are the root foundation of thought, emotion, and we're actually being present in the physical body. Without minerals, nothing can happen. Vitamins can't operate. Functions in the body can't happen. Hormones can't be made. You know, minerals are everything. And zinc in particular is very unique. I mean, think about it. They dip steel in zinc to keep it from corroding and rusting. That's called galvanization, right? Mm -hmm. Just think about what it's doing in the body. Zinc acts as a super antioxidant in the body from top to bottom. If you're deficient in zinc, most likely you have low libido, Mm -hmm. low energy, depression. You're not motivated. You might have flaky skin. Mm. You're probably not sleeping well. You're probably not metabolizing well. Zinc is so profound in the human body that it crosses almost every barrier in the body. What do I mean by that? It's in your saliva. Yeah. It's in your snot. Mm-hmm. It's in your piss. Yeah. It's in your sweat. It's everywhere. And why is that? Because the our bodies are designed to operate with good zinc in the body. So mm-hmm. this formula is powerful. The results that we're having, the testimonials we're having, and just take it from me, this might be the most powerful formula we have at Symbiotica, and that's saying a lot. We have three forms of zinc in here. Two of them are trademarked. We also have two forms of copper in here. Copper and zinc might displace each other. That's why we have to have the perfect ratios in there. Uh And then we also have selenium in there, Mm. which creates the trifecta of these three critical minerals that we're not getting in our foods. Most people aren't eating oysters every day. Mm. And sometimes you just want to be able to reach in your cabinet and grab one little capsule I highly recommend eating this with your largest meal of the day Mm. because it's that strong until your body acclimates to it. I'm very, very happy about how this turned out and the results that it's having for both men and women. Excellent. You know, I know that uh, selenium deficiency is linked to uh, heart heart problems, holes in the hearts, heart valve dysfunction. Cancers, yeah, diabetes. Uh, on. New Zealand has a d- deficiency of selenium in their soil, and they were having a lot of problems with heart problems in the sheep there. Yep. And they tracked it to selenium deficiency. And I've also known of people that needed selenium to heal their heart. So what a great combination. So if you want to get your zinc complex, go to symbiotica.com, C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. And as a Living 4D listener, use the code CHECK15 on checkout and get 15% off your zinc complex and any of Symbiotica's amazing products. So enjoy and please take care of yourself. We all need to get our hands together and make the world a better place right now. So if your zinc complex and your Symbiotica products help us do that, then that's a worthy investment. Lots of love. This is uh, apparently one of your favorite things to talk about. Love it. I know what this is. So um, you speak of an interesting concept regarding the potential negative effects of language that you describe as the Borg versus Star Trek. So can you help me understand that one? It sounds very interesting. It's It's a simple, back to that word, it's a simple equation for what we can expect if we... The global we get our story straighter and more responsible and more empowered uh, and out of the victim mentality. And it's also a formula for what will happen if we stay there. Right. Okay. Because uh, bar a comet or an EMP, technology is here to stay. Yeah. So here's the math. 
humans plus technology plus the victim mentality, okay, equals the Borg. Yeah. So, and this also circles back to something we referenced earlier, which is how much of this are we creating? And in, in, in my simple mind, the universe is a feedback loop. Yeah, it is. And so if there are 7 billion, and we're all doing it, or some, most people are doing it to their own degrees, playing the victim, Yeah. okay, sure. what, consciously or unconsciously, all good, then the universe in all its wisdom says, well, if, okay, if we've got a bunch of victims down there, we're going to give you an ultimate villain. Yes. Okay, there you go. Mm-hmm. Got to complete the story. <laughs> Got to complete the story, bring it full circle, which also, it, it's a very empowering storyline, is that, you know, we can address these big picture boogie monsters, Freddy Kruegers, uh, in a very real practical way, as far as, you know, quantum mechanics is concerned, by cleaning up our own story. Mm-hmm. It, it goes, it, 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 like I said, tremendous things will happen in your life and in your spheres of influence by you clearing out your stories, minimizing the victim mentality, empowering your language. So we could we could get the Borg. The Borg, they're not having fun. They're not dancing. Nobody has a suntan. They got uh, tubes and, and machines coming out of them. Nobody's having sex. It's a, it, it, There's an omniscient center point at the very top that knows everything that's going on. There's no free thought. It is hive mind. Okay. Look it's, up a picture of the Borg, folks. You tell me if that looks fun. You've just described the New World Order. <laughs> I just described transhumanism. Yeah. I just described transhumanism in what I believe is the reality of that um, of, of that operation. Yeah. And then there's the other side of the coin. So humans plus technology plus an architect mentality or a responsible heroes taking responsibility for the story I'm creating for myself mentality. That equals Star Trek. They're out and about. They've retained their humanity, their warmth, um, their senses of humor, mm-hmm. and they're out. They've they've they're out having adventures, getting in problems, conflicts, figuring things out. They're alive. The Borg yeah. is essentially dead. They the Borg has extricated and extinguished the soul of humanity, mm-hmm. which I do believe is. And you can put me in this category now, folks. I believe that that is one of the main objectives of transhumanism. Oh, well, that's well discussed, as James Tunney made very, very clear on my podcast with him about that. You said you'd listen to that one? I've listened to that one. Yeah, because, uh, you know, James is also a mystic, and he's researched this with great depth. And Steiner spoke about it. Uh, he, I've got, that's all my Steiner books right behind you. And he stated, I believe, oh, early 1900s, that in the future, vaccinations would be made that would make people not only materialistic, but would dis- detach them from their soul. And so he was warning about that a long time ago. And you don't want people connected to their soul because your soul is the gateway to all possibilities. Your soul is source within you. It's God consciousness within you. So someone who's truly connected to their soul really knows that almost anything's possible. And all they got to do is be in line with the vision, mission, and values that they're heading towards. But as soon as you detach someone from that, then you really just become like a biological machine that someone else is using with remote control. Steiner said it, one of my favorite Steiner quotes in in, in this particular conversation is, we're talking about language and, and spells and, and, and abracadabra. Abracadabra, folks, look up that. Look up the origin of that word. It does not mean magic. It's Aramaic. It's the that's the language. It's an ancient language still spoken in some parts that's of Persia. It's the language Jesus spoke. It's the language Jesus spoke. It's the language the original Old Testament was written in, mm-hmm. and it translates to "with my word I create" or "with my word I influence." In the metaphysicians mm-hmm. of the day, they would triangulate it and wear it around their neck. I'm having William Author make me a, a, a abracadabra pendant to compliment my AK-47 pendant. <laughs> <laughs> one one A and two A, folks, forever, mm-hmm. and and he said that that any force that seeks to constrict or control is by definition Luciferian. Yes, mm-hmm. and whether Aramonic. it's exactly yeah. whether it's uh, an I'm not good enough or she's ruining my, ruining my life or I think I might want to possibly do this one day. Those are all forms of stress and constriction, and so by, literally by definition, and we talk about this rarely, depending on the audience. 
we're in the Luciferian spell breaking business. We're here to break spells of constriction Mm -hmm. and control and cast spells of expansion and liberation and joy and harmony and, and, and warmth and really get people back into their bodies and in their hearts. And from there we can solve any problem. Yeah. I agree. And I, I'm glad you're, you're doing what you're doing. You're the only person or do you guys, your, your program, I've never seen anything else like it. And, um, when someone, I don't know if it was Mike Salemi or Alex Rubchinsky. Love Salemi. Yeah, Mike's an amazing guy. One of the most amazing athletes I ever worked with. Um, so I can't remember who it was that turned me on to you first, but, and then it happened. Then someone else said, oh, you got to have this guy in your podcast. And so I started getting these, you know, when, first time I hear it, I think maybe. Second time I hear it, I go, okay, that's two. And then the third time I say, okay, the universe is giving me a message. But because it, it was about language and, and it was presented to me as something you, you teach coaches and exercise, I, I just thought, I wonder what in the world that's going to look like in practical application. I just was curious, right? But then once we met and we talked to prepare for the podcast, uh, then it was very, very clear to me. But I think really that <laughs> you need to expand your market way outside you know, strength and conditioning or what, what's the main market you're working in? Is it strength and conditioning? Well, we've sourced and we've been so blessed. Uh, our, our coaches, our coaching community is they're, they're awesome. We love them. They love us. It's fact. When we went on barbell shrugged in 2017, we got introduced to the fitness industry through, well, barbell shrugged. And, um, and most of our coaches have come through the fitness industry and we're, yes, uh, I'd say the other half comes from a variety of different backgrounds and, you know, for whatever reason, um, fitness people in the fitness industry are, uh, they like us, you know, I'm going to share something with you guys about the fitness industry that a lot of fitness and health, fitness and health. A lot of people don't think about this, but do you realize that personal trainers and strength coaches are about the only people left on the planet in the health and exercise community that actually spend an hour one-on-one with people. And that's exactly why, like to, to further elaborate on what Mark mentioned, it's as a health coach myself and group fitness instructor myself, the, there's a handful of reasons why this works so seamlessly in that industry. Yeah. First thing is the duration of time that you spend with your clients meaning you develop such a strong relationship with them in the time that you spend with them repeatedly week after week after week. Mm -hmm. You're often as a health coach or trainer, one of the first people that uh, hears about someone venting about their personal problems too. Yes. And there's, so that's one, there's a trust and confiding that happens with your trainer and with your coach. Mm -hmm. The second piece is foundationally what our principles are, words, stories, and breath. So with breathing, there's a component of, I have to be able to breathe, to work with this system, and I have to be open-minded enough to do it. Mm -hmm. There's also some other foundational pieces that we expect somebody who's on this journey of personal development is going to uh, have, which is eating well, moving well, breathing well, and then have a, an investment in making themselves a little bit better. Yeah. So if you're in the gym consistently and you're working with a coach in that nature, you're predisposed to to those things and you have that foundation to build on yeah. top of and we can address the mental conversation in an, in another layer. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Mike Bledsoe, who is a big portion of, of building and lifted from the beginning within the fitness industry, he, you know, fitness is the gateway to personal development Mm -hmm. and let's meet our people where they're at. Let's. It was Mike that told me about it. Yeah. He was the first one. Mike Bledsoe. Mm -hmm. Mike, I think Mike Salemi may have mentioned it, but it was a couple of years ago when I was at, uh, paleo FX and I think he was working on it with you. How long ago did you guys start the program? We started working on the way of the enlifted athlete, which was the online training program that we created in 2018. Yes. And we launched it at Paleo Effects 2019. Okay. Because I was doing a podcast with him and he was telling me what he was working on. And I thought it was very interesting. So that's the beginning of my connection to you and the program. But then it kept reoccurring in my life with other people telling me. Um, How is the program run? Like, how do you 
and how long is the program? So if I signed up, what would I be going through? So the program is a total of 10 weeks long. We have an introductory. We do this live. Mark coaches the entire thing live. And we sign up coaches that for an entirety of 10 weeks. First call, we get them started, acquainted, interested in the work. Then we go in through a process of working our personal stories together in the, in the span of seven sessions, one each week. They're also doing some self-study along the way, learning the foundations of conflict language, architect language, and how to translate that. And then we finish it up with some uh, practical application of it, working within your group of coaches, coaching each other, practicing with each other. And then we have a graduation on week 10. And through that journey, we say, you know, it's both personal development and professional development. Mm -hmm. You're getting that two for one because you're working on yourself while you're learning the skill set to apply this with other people. Now, when you say live, do you mean someone has to fly to a location? Oh, we do it over Zoom. Okay. We do it over Zoom. So Mark's instructing them. You're going to work directly with Mark learning this process. Right. And so people can do it by the web. They don't yeah, have to actually all take online. airplane rides because today that's <laughs> yeah stressful. And We have students all over the globe and yeah. we, you know, we, we keep the classes versus pre-recording it or content that you could soon can self consume. There's uh there's nuance to this work that can only happen through working together live and doing it together in real time um, and practicing it together in real time. You can take, you can take our online courses. You'll get something from them. Uh, you will not get nearly as much as you will working with us or working with an enlifted coach. No, because you can't get direct answers to any millions of different questions that might come up. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course there's some benefits to getting some training, of course, but yeah, doing the doing it, being in the group and then learning from all the other experiences others are having is very powerful too. Yeah. So it's it's ten weeks of training. How many hours a week is that? Four, four and a half. Yeah. It's so, very it's very manageable to take as far as time commitment is concerned. Is that four hours in one meeting or how do you break two that hours up? in a live meeting, about two hours of self study. Okay, so one meeting a week? One meeting or a week. Two hours, two hours of self study. That's very doable, especially for something that can completely change your life. Yeah. It's very niche. You learn the art and science of how to use everyday ordinary language with yourself. Like she said, it's very much personal and professional development. Uh, in you learn how to dismantle the victim mentality as far as, with, as far as learning the language patterns of it, what to do with the stories. This, um, so I've been doing this 15 years, the last seven and a half, all of my sessions have been virtual. Mm -hmm. So this is extremely, uh, it's built for virtual coaching. It can be done just as easy in person. And most of our coaches learn because, well, they're, they, 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 they can use it both in person and, uh, and virtually and the certification, it gives you the trifecta of mastery. And, and this is, uh, uh, you, you need all three on a, on a timeline. You need the skill set mm -hmm. of whatever the thing is. You need an identity that supports you taking it into the arena and competing, also known as charging for your services, getting paid for your coaching. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you need a community. Mm -hmm. You put those three things together and stay on that path, and you're going to get very good, very fast. And this, this is um, circling back to why fitness. In fitness, the, there's a conversation about, and it's great. Let's keep talking about it, mindset. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when the conversation about mindset is, is only kept and where this is where it's held most of the time on this big picture, uh, macro level, it's this thing I know I need to get better at, but how, and then there's that confident person over there that looks fun. I'm over here. Whoops. When we add in what words to use less of and why, what words to use more of and why, how to converse someone through where they're at in their um, a, adult life back into the foundational childhood, uh, uh, stuck stories, traumas, call it what you will, and get those on paper and air them out, then mindset becomes practical. Mm -hmm. You can practice using language differently. You can practice dismantling the victim mentality and, and, and really building yourself up into the person that you know you can be. And, uh, it, do you guys have a community, like a Facebook community or something where people can talk to each other and, you know, so maybe we have, work through challenges or something? Yeah. So what we have is we use a platform called Mighty Networks. Mm -hmm. And it's a, essentially a private Facebook group. And we've certified now over 200 coaches with this method and skill set. And 
this is uh, this is coaching techniques that are a plug in to an existing coaching business, yeah, right? right? So yeah. you have you have a collection of other skills, and this is a specific technique that you're going to utilize within your specific profession of coaching. And what is awesome about the fact that we we have so much continuing education within once you go through our level one certification, you got two more options for uh, course style instruction, level two and level three. And you could opt to go through level one and have a complete understanding of the system and you could continue on to those levels of mastery, or you can stay in the, and participate in our community events. So some of these, we open up to the public. We host free workshops often. And then we have constant ongoing workshops for our coaches once they're certified. So they're learning as they're practicing, getting in the reps of utilizing this skill for themselves and with others, they're learning together, connecting together, collaborating together, uh, we do, everybody's got podcasts that they're going on sharing, you know, collecting information together and building each other up. And that's the component Mark spoke on about community, about if you want to be successful with something, Mm -hmm. you need a group of peers who are, who are elevating you to do that. And Mm -hmm. what's awesome is we have, I mean, Mike Salemi is part of that, you know, and the level three coaches and there's uh, countless other people in there that have the same unique level of mastery in a specific area that then apply this technique on top of so you can go learn through each other as well it's often coaches are hiring each other coaches are collaborating to build complementary programs they're uh hosting events workshops and it's a happening community it's, yeah it's i mean really one is. of the big challenges that i know i faced previous to this was feeling like how do i connect with other people that are doing something similar to me mm-hmm. and feel like as a solopreneur that i'm working with other people or that i have support with another person that thinks like me or speaks like me, or has the same goals and vision as me. And there's uh, 200 of a mother that, that that are. And that's, it's growing. And it's rapidly growing. We're really excited for well, what we're I'm doing in 2022. Too. We need, we need a, a lot of this. And the, the thing that is coming to my mind that I think is important for the listeners is that this would be very good for anyone who's in a, a leadership position. Absolutely. At, at a job for uh People that are, um, what do they call them? Personnel managers. We do team trainings Mm -hmm. and we're working with a couple companies right now. And we've done this within gyms as well. And we facilitate language trainings within a group and as a team so that they are working through this at the same time to help improve the culture and improve their productivity, improve their uh, working relationships. And the managers always have that feedback of, wow, I can deliver. I can coach and manage my people better you know who this is the most important for in my opinion parents ding 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 parents because what is a parent but a coach for a child that the the words are interchangeable yeah i mean um i think this should be something that every parent should really consider because you know how you use your words really shapes the child's inner inner um, perception of themselves which shapes their future parents language scaffolds children's identities yeah it really is and there's uh we're working on uh we're running one of our first specialty courses this year it's about ancestral uh healing and, and ancestral stories yeah and we're these are we're called, the specialty courses come after you've learned the foundations of level one and level two. Yeah. So the they're shorter courses, and what we have plans to do is to build those out as there will be a parenting course, there'll be a nutrition specific course, there'll mm-hmm. be a uh, you know educator specific course. Those are the ones we've identified that again the nuance, right? The the practical specific application beyond the foundation and the basis, and the parenting one is one we often get strong feedback. Um, from our coaches that are parents and say, this is helping me great in my business, but you it's know what's helping me a lot more at home best. with my kids. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Also be really good for relationships, mm-hmm. you know, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, yeah. worker, coworker. I think once you learn the, the inner structure of how to use language effectively and positively, then you're, you're actually impacting every single person you talk to. Absolutely. So, well, good. And and can you tell us how much the course, what is the investment in the course? 
The level one certification is $3,299, dollars mm-hmm. And we've got a special discount for the check listeners that found us here today. You can use the code CHECK10 at checkout. That'll get you 10% off. That's nice. Our next course, we're enrolling for March 15th. I'm not so- sure when this will show will launch exactly, but we, mm-hmm. we launch the live cohorts every other month. Okay. And we've got uh, ongoing enrollment. There's... By the time you listen to this, you may be pushed to our May group Mm -hmm. um, or beyond, but reach out to us and and you'll find us at Mm enlifted.me, which is our website, or at Enlifted Coaches on Instagram and check check us out, talk to us and and see how, ask us questions. You know, like Mark said, we're open source with this. And if you found something interesting you want to use in your coaching, go try it, practice it, come back to us, ask us questions about it. Uh, where where do people find you to sign up and get more information? Enlifted.me. That's the website. Okay, enlifted.me. That sounds pretty good. Any closing comments, you guys? Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks you for having do. us up yeah, here. Thanks this for having a, us. It was a, a pleasure, an honor, a very fun uh, conversation. And um, yeah, we've been we've been looking forward to this. Once we got it on the calendar, it's uh, yeah, this yeah. was this is well, very enjoyable. I enjoyed it too, and and I. I'll tell you what I enjoyed the most about it, how damn important it is. Yes. Right? This is, wow. I mean, if you look at the issues of the world and ask yourself this question, could we resolve the issues in the world if we don't do this, what we talked about today? I don't possibly see how that's going to happen. Neither do I. <clears throat> and fact, you should, you should, uh, Go speak to the government. I'm ready <laughs> about doing this on a mass government scale. Well, I can see Mark working at the UN teaching in lifted language. <laughs> That's the thing. We're we're teachers to the core. We'll teach anyone that wants to learn. And um, can we fix the the global problems that we see without doing this? Likely, unlikely. To 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 state that to spell that in the affirmative. Can we address and minimize and make progress on these bigger global uh, issues that we have by doing this, by going into our personal stories uh, and and you know, cleaning them up and empowering our language? Yes, I say that definitively. Mm, uh, me too. Yeah. I mean, what is what is a, a, a what is the government but a reflection of the people? What is a nation but a bunch of individuals? You know, we the people. Arnold it's Mand- right there. Arnold right Mandel there. says a culture is a bunch of people doing the same things. And if we're all doing the same things in a negative way or an unskillful way, we're sure as hell not going to create a, uh, you know, a lot of opportunity and possibility. It's 100%. And what's the substrate of, of, of culture? If it's either the substrate or one of the main substrates of culture is language. Yeah. Well, without language, it's pretty hard to connect, which is, I guess, why we have it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much, and thank you to my sponsors for all your love and support and for making such amazing products. Thank you to all of you for anything you buy from the sponsors. It supports the podcast, and thank you to all of you. And if you guys feel that this podcast is as important as I did and we do, then please share it. And if you want to make a really wise investment in your health, your relationships, your well-being in your future and the future of this planet, then I can't think of a better way to invest $3,200 because there's a lot of things you can buy for $3,200 that might make you look cool, but won't really grow you or transform your life. So um, thank you all for really considering the information. And if you don't make the investment, then please invest in using all the techniques that were shared today Because any one of these techniques, from looking at your story to getting your core sentence to being more aware of whether you're victimizing yourself to how to use affirmations positively to how to pay attention to your breathing to listening to people's wants, feelings, and needs. I mean, we covered a lot of techniques, any one of which can really help people heal and grow. So, Imagine if you applied what you got in the podcast, how much more you'd get in 10 weeks of real training than that 
$3,200 seems like a very magical investment that can pay off for the rest of your life, literally with every word <laughs> that you say. So thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. And thank you. Um, hey, if you love the podcast, share it. If you didn't, it's our secret, okay? <laughs> and uh, remember, as crazy it is as it is out there, if you go to your heart and you focus on possibilities and you know it's true that we are safe, we are home, and we are whole. Aho, great spirit. It is done. It is done. It is done. See you next time. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Mark England. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Mark is offering Living 4D with Paul Check listeners 10% off the Enlifted Coaches Certification Level 1 with the code CHECK10. That's uppercase C, uppercase H, uppercase E, uppercase K, the number one zero. Go to bit.ly forward slash Enlifted L4D. That's bit.ly forward slash Enlifted uppercase L, the number four, uppercase D. And if you'd like to learn more about the Enlifted method, please visit enlifted.me or follow Mark on Instagram at Enlifted Coaches. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Follow Paul Check on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chakiva.com.